Hello, you're listening to Death of the Reader here on the Extended Cut. <gasps> the best part of the show where all the cool people are at. Yes, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> like us, obviously. I, I suppose we're on both parts. So. It's true. Anyway, the extended <laughs> cut is our chance to uh, give you all of the extra bits that didn't quite make it into the yeah. show itself. Yeah. Uh, it's always a good time. Uh, sometimes it's a bit of a mess. I mean, that's the fun part. That's what makes it so cool, right? Because unfortunately, we can only fit, you know, 30 minutes in our regularly scheduled program at, you know, 9 p.m. Sunday. But all those little extra bits and bobs, the stuff that we want to keep in but just can't quite... You can find it right here. That's right. Coming up right now, we have part one of the extended cut, where we'll talk a little bit about the introduction to the novel. We talk about the feuilleton, mm. the serialized nature of the story is released, and we're going to talk a little bit about Vidoc, the character that inspired Sherlock Holmes and Tabaret and Lecoq and all of these famous detectives in that chain of authors. Sounds pretty important and engaging. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> You'll also hear coming up a bit later Professor Keith Rathburn from Macquarie University, an expert on the French Revolution, talking a bit about the historical context. And then in the last part of the show, it's time, Herds, for you and I to throw down. I do enjoy that. That is my favorite part of the show. And if you thought it, the original show was rambly, wait till you hear the extended cut. This is the extended cut on Death of the Reader. You're listening to Death of the Reader, your murder mystery world tour on 2SER, and we are Flex and Herds, and it's time for a brand new story. Well, 1866 is hardly new. My goodness, you're clearly still feeling a bit defeated after the floating admiral last I'm week. I'm not defeated. If anything, I've come back stronger than ever. <laughs> but you are absolutely right. Nonetheless, it is a new novel for me, and today we'll be starting with chapters one to seven of the classic French detective novel, The La Rouge Case. Woo! so excited yeah this is a fun novel i i hope you're enjoying it as much as as much as i've enjoyed the whole thing so far with this bite-sized piece of experience but yeah i was just excited to get out of england um <laughs> some um, would say that that itself was a harder challenge than everything we've discussed thus far i would agree honestly that was the biggest that was the toughest part we were like man we've been in england for two whole for two whole weeks now we got to get out of here we got to see the world and trying to find a, a link, especially from, from the detection club, that he gave me lots of all this to work with, was, was difficult uh, at best. Um, yeah, I ended up going from Agatha Christie to, to Belgium, uh, to, to, Belgium um, to the French Chirité, and eventually ended up with Emile Gaborio. And I want to I wanna say right now before we go in, this ain't a, this ain't a Falk's pass or anything but <laughs> i may not be the best at pronouncing the french words please do not i do not i don't me. think either of us will be though we would love to hear your corrections and promptly proceed to not ignore them not, not use them accurately yes, that's exactly what's <laughs> going to happen but yeah i mean it's no secret i i think to anyone that detective fiction is kind of globally centered for most people around the uk yes i mean especially as english-speaking readers there's not really much room to maneuver there. Mm -hmm. The golden age of detective fiction as it's known was, you know, the in early 20th century in England. Yep, it was in England. And so trying to find something outside of that is, is a death sentence, basically. But we did it. We made it. All yeah. the way to 1866 to find a novel. And uh, yeah, we're doing the Leverage case. Uh, today we're doing chapters one to seven, which is a fun time. And uh, yeah, how, how are you finding it? Particularly difficult? I... I don't want to say that I'm finding it particularly difficult because <laughs> I, I don't, I mean, I, I'm not, but I also don't want to come in here, you know, guns blazing and be like, pow, 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 it was this, it was this, and just be completely <laughs> wrong. I do want to say, though, I think that the thing that was particularly interesting to me about this novel was seeing where a lot of the, I don't, I don't want to call them tropes, but a lot of the archetypes from yeah. detective fiction originated because yeah. many would attribute this to be like the first detective fiction novel, yes. right? Yes, absolutely. I've, I've done a bit of research, as you do. Uh, this story was originally published uh, in a newspaper, a serialized, a uh, fouilleton, apparently is the, the French term for it. Um, and it was, you know, one of the first detective novels. It was designed to be read, you know, one chapter at a time, like your weekly comics, you know? Um, instead of the, the Phantom, it was it was uh, Monsieur Lecoq and his and his adventures, um, or, or Tabaret. And uh, yeah, a lot of the tropes that we kind of see 
Um, one of the most interesting ones being the conflict with the detective and the police uh, is to be found in this novel. Um, as some of you may know, the uh, detective Sherlock Holmes is somewhat inspired by uh, Emile's works here. And I think that uh, that inspiration even comes from, from further back. There was a, a criminal turned detective known as uh, Vidocq, apparently, who was, uh, I mean, he was a criminal. He was a thief. And the police started to take him on and he became a bit of a hobbyist detective. And eventually they threw him in jail because he was too good. It, so, it sounds like, it sounds totally made up. Yeah. When you, when you put it like well, that. Well, that's the fun part is that we have his memoirs, but some of it may be true, some of it may be not. We don't really know. All we know is that he used to disguise himself and apparently say, I would, it was me. I was Vidoc the entire time. And then run off into the sunset. I assume. Um, and yeah, that's where, that's where Emil gets his writing from. That's where he got his ideas for his detectives. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of culture here. There's a lot of history. That's, that's really interesting. I didn't know that coming into the novel. And I think that there's certain things like quirks to the novel that make a bit more sense when you put it in that light. Mm. Um, I think that when we talk about, you know, the whole police versus detective angle, th it, like, it, it doesn't really feel justified. It just kind of starts. It's like the first chapter of the novel, they're just like, oh, do we really need Tabaret's help? What is this? And they do, because he's the best, and he can just make conjecture <laughs> out of nothing, and it's 100% correct. Wait, and hold on, you're, just, you're just admitting that? You're just admitting his conjectures are correct? You know what? I can confirm not deny anything, but... As far as you know, 100% correct. I see. Sir. Yeah, he is very self-confident with his conjectures, which is, I mean. For a man of 60 years old, yes. Yeah. <laughs> like, it doesn't seem, you know, like a particularly out of place character archetype, but it certainly does feel a bit unjustified when he, you know, says, oh, here's this thing, walks around the corner. Ah, oh, it is that thing. Yeah. I mean, that's that's all throughout the novel. Um, that's one of the... I don't know. I guess criticisms of the novel, there's a lot of weird coincidences and stuff just kind of happens. It's like, oh, like, here's my surprise witness. And it's like, it's a clown car, you know, like stuff just kind of happens to, to resolve things, to push things forward. But I think it's really fun. It's really quaint. Um, and it's really fun to go back and read this novel from back in the, the mid 19th century. That was a long time ago. I certainly wasn't born then. <laughs> but maybe I was. Maybe. I, I do find it interesting looking at those coincidences and wondering if maybe that was like the early way to kind of keep an audience reading knowing that something exciting was going to happen each week like yeah those coincidences whilst they definitely are a bit jarring at times they also do mean that things are constantly moving forwards yes yes and i think that in the serialized format that this story supposedly came out in that would have been the audience like, oh, I wonder what conjecture Tabaret yeah. is going to make this week. What strange new character is going to appear at the start of next chapter? Yeah. Which is, I mean, that's something that happens. It's early clickbait. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> um, yeah, I really enjoy that aspect of, of the writing. I think that it's fun that he has, you know, Emil has this challenge to overcome. How do I keep people gripped? How do I keep them interested? How could I not just exposit every other chapter? You know, I think that's what's really fun about it. Um, and so it keeps you, keeps you reading, keeps you coming back to check not just the news, but the news on crime, one indeed, might say. Indeed, indeed. I think the other thing that I found really fun was uh, Lecoq, or however it is you pronounce his name. Lecoq. He is, he is the detective that <laughs> I think most people would know yeah. from this author, but he barely happens in this story. Yeah, he's just he's just there to set up Tabaret and then wring his hands in amazement at Tabaret's or Tabaret Claire as he is he's apparently known as it's, well. It's so brilliant because he reads name. just like an absolute hype man it's and I so love good. it. It's so good. He's just crazy for this this old man and being like what is he going to say next? The thing is is when you picture him as the inspiration for Sherlock Holmes hmm. and then try and picture a modern variation of Sherlock Holmes but as a hype man like, well, <laughs> one one fun thing, uh, Colonel Arthur Doyle, she, he, she wrote about uh, Monsieur Lecoq and called him, uh, I believe, a, a bumbling fool, with, <laughs> <laughs> which is, I mean, not incorrect. <laughs> so you're saying that he was more of a Watson inspiration because I was under the impression Maybe. that he was more of a Sherlock inspiration. I mean, I think he is definitely a Sherlock inspiration. Like, as we say, coming from the uh, Vidocq as well, the, the, the disguises um, and the kind of way, the creative way that you approach approach crime. I think that that's kind of where Sherlock uh, got his inspiration from, right? Um, I'm imagining, like, I haven't read a lot of 
pre-1860 detective novels, but I'm imagining that it's a lot less of this creative, you know, checking your, your contacts in the underground and trying to trying to trap people in like interesting ways and pretending to be other people. There's a lot less of that and probably a lot more, um, you know, strict interrogation, um, which we don't really get a, a lot of in this, in this novel, but we'll, we'll get on that later. Well, I think the other thing was that when we look at particularly the opening scenes with the police department and Tabaret wandering around the house, mm. there isn't really anyone in that scene aside from like, I guess the extras that feels uh, like incompetent. Like sure. everyone's noticing clues and making conjectures. Sure, yeah. It's not just the detective walking and going, walking around and going, ah, and this happened and ah, and this happened. Like well, he does, but he's not he the only eventually. one in the scene. Yes, yes, yes. There's a bit more of a character dynamic there, which I think yeah. is, I don't want to say lost in more modern novels, but definitely less prevalent yeah. in the ones I've read. There's kind of a, a background ensemble that's going on. And you're right, In certainly in more modern novels, there's this idea of having to to push the the main character and like this is the character you identify with and and have tears with and break bread with and and see what they're doing but yeah this novel feels in a strange way it it feels humbler but also feels more natural it feels like a lot of the stuff that's happening um a lot of the way the the cops of the, the police approach the crime the, the gendarmes um it feels like they're real real people or real characters i suppose not not quite real people but but close to it close enough Oh yeah, um, I mean, there's also those moments where like they're like, "Oh, where's the key gone? Oh, it's right here." Yeah, exactly. And, like, like it you, feels much more organic. Yeah, you would expect in a modern novel for that to turn into, or even a, a 19, you know, 20th century novel, you'd expect that to be. This is the locked room mystery of the key. How could it have come into this place down the well? We are looking for a man with with mud in his arms, you know, stuff like that. But there isn't. It's just there's a there's a key. Now we can get into the house. Isn't that handy? <laughs> Yeah, right? and I mean, it does leave room for other clues. Like, sure. it's not to say that other novels don't just present clues immediately, because that's sure. one of the ways you can move things forward is by kind of setting up a bit of anticipation. But, oh, that was, you sure. know, that was a red herring. Mm. Um, but I think that the way that this novel does it certainly feels, I guess, a bit more like a play in the way that it runs out. Yeah, I would, I would it's agree It's more characters that. coming in and out of the scene and having their moment on stage rather than... Yeah just kind of following the puzzle down a line. There's also a lot more uh, visual descriptions of the characters, the way that they throw themselves around, like grabbing their faces with their hands and, and covering themselves and turning the face away. Like I could picture this being put on stage in a theater and I would love to see that. Um, yeah, I do wonder if Gaborio actually started out writing theater because it certainly maybe. does does come across that way. Yeah. The, the weakness of that is that then there are some passages that you read and you're just like, wait, who... Who is talking right now? Like, Those are the best parts, trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah, That's the real detective moment. Because like, <laughs> if, you, if you had the visual, it'd make sense that like, oh, these two characters up on the balcony are there, and then we mm. cut down to the two characters on the street, and they continue the scene. But the way that it's written just as plain text makes it seem like that's one conversation. So did mm. they just teleport off the balcony well, to the ground? Like, what's going on here? I think the, the other thing that kind of the thing that kind of helps you with those scenes is that a lot of those scenes are, are not very important or the characters are, they are just extras. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite, I, I don't want to say tropes, but elements of the story is, is the messages. There are a number of points throughout the story where the characters say, they say, I've made this discovery. I've, I've figured <laughs> this out. I need to talk to this character. So rather than having a scene with that character, I'm going to send a messenger. Hey, you kid, come over yeah. here. I got a, I got a, I got a parcel for the, you. The messages are never important characters. They're just nameless just NPCs that, that are being sent off. They're just nameless, like actors, you know, part of the ensemble, um, and they're just being sent off. Um, there's one part in particular that I that I remember. We are not here to talk, but to discover the guilty. Said he to the corporal. That information be at once conveyed to the justice of the peace and the mayor, and send this letter without delay to the Palais de Justice. In a couple of hours, an investigating magistrate can be here. In the meanwhile, I will proceed to make a preliminary inquiry. Shall I carry the letter? Asked the corporal of gendarmes. No. Send one of your men. You will be useful to me here in keeping these people in order and in finding any witnesses I may want. We must leave everything here as it is. I will install myself in the other room. A gendarme departed at a run towards the station at Rueil, and the commissary commenced his investigations in regular form as prescribed by law. Yeah, I think that maybe when we get to solving the mystery, which obviously we will in the third part of the show today, but when we get to solving the mystery, I think it's a lot more obvious which characters have been named and which ones haven't, because yeah. there's a lot of characters that are given, you know, 
uh, improper nouns, and there's a lot of characters that are just like the messenger, the yep. concierge, the corporal, the locksmith. Yeah, but the when we earrings. when we definitely get the important. names, we know they're someone, right? Yeah, we know they're important. And I think that that's definitely something that's carried on for the the later history of murder mystery. Yep. But you can definitely see it at play in a very distinct, clear manner here. Sure. Yeah. Um. The other thing going back to what we were talking about with, you know, the police feeling a bit more real and having a bit more competence, mm. I do wonder how much of this is, like, actually the due process of the police in France at the time, because there's a lot of, like, bumbling around, and, you know, they are looking for clues and stuff, but they're just kind of, oh, let's just trudge into this here crime <laughs> scene and wander around the house, and, like, was that actually the carelessness that they went? I think it might be. I mean, it was the, it was the 1800s, dude. We yeah. didn't have due process back then. We had Because I know when we were looking at uh, the floating admiral, yeah. uh, Canon Whitechurch, who was one of the authors of that book, uh, he was credited as being one of the first detective fiction authors to actually go to the police and say, like, hey, is this how would you would do right. things? Right, yeah. Um, and, like... I don't think that Gaboriau did, but maybe because things were a bit more simple and the processes weren't as defined, maybe this is almost as genuine. But now, Herds, it's time for our regular little guest spot. This week is Dr. Keith Rathburn, an expert on French history who maybe can teach us a thing or two about the historical context of this novel and maybe how to pronounce things correctly. This is Death of the Reader. You're listening to Death of the Reader on 2SER, where your hosts, Flex and Herds, and today we have a very special guest, Keith Rathburn, world-class historian and specialist on all things French. Tell me, Keith, how are you going today? Good. Thanks for having me on, guys. It's <laughs> wonderful having you here. So, our novel, The Le Rouge Case, was written and also takes place in the period just before the founding of the Third Republic in France. I wanted to ask about the kind of political climate at the time in the wake of the revolution uh, the French is so well known for. Well, the the late 18th and, and really the mid-19th century in France are the ages of revolution. There's a whole series of revolutions starting with the French Revolution that we all know and love and, and terminating, I, I guess you might want to say, in the revolutions of 1848, mm -hmm. which bring in the Second Republic and then in uh, 1851, you have Louis Napoleon, Napoleon III, who uh, seizes power uh, through a coup. And it's in this second empire that, the second Napoleonic empire, rather, that this book is taking place. So this book takes place in this moment of, of revolutionary um, uh, disquiet, but then immediately afterwards, this kind of settling down, this emergence of this strong empire, and, and people really associated the Napoleonic empires, both the, the first Napoleonic empire, but especially the, the second Napoleonic empire, at least at first with, with prosperity and, and, and generally with, with uh, real progressive change in some ways, which seems a little strange given that they're empires. But um, I think it, it dovetails into the politics of this book that we were talking about a little bit before the interview started. A lot of the humor in the novel is at the expense of the, of the French aristocracy. And I'd say there's a lot of, you know, anti-aristocratic undertones this novel. Um, I'm curious about the position of the aristocracy following the turmoil of the revolution and the, and the Second Republic. What was their situation like in, uh, in the, I guess, the mid-1800s? So I think the thing that you need to know about the French aristocracy is that throughout the 19th century, it's really in, in flux. Hmm. So before the French Revolution, there's three orders within France. There's the First Order, which are the clergy, there's the second order, which are the nobility, and then there's the third order, the third estate, which is everybody else. Mm -hmm. And that's 97% of all the people in France. And France, in this period before the French Revolution, is a world of privilege. Mm -hmm. So every different order um, has its own rights and privileges. So for example, if you were a member of the third estate and you were in the, in the guild that made uh, barrels, nobody else was allowed to make barrels. Well, the nobles have some of the most um, beneficial privileges, you might think of them, within the old regime or the ancien regime. They don't pay any mm -hmm. tax. All the peasants have to uh, pay them certain duties, uh, uh, specifically on salt, specifically on the milling of grain, and they also have to give them over a, pos a portion of their, um, uh, of their agricultural uh, production. Right. So these nobles are um, 
many of them in the eyes of the peasantry, at least, or in the eyes of most ordinary French people, mm. which is to say uh, a, an expropriating class. And then the French Revolution changes all that. All these seigneurial privileges are thrown by the wayside. And in the 19th century, the French noble class, the aristocracy, is really trying to, to, to figure out where they fit within the new French uh, social mm. system. They still exist. They're still by far the richest um, group of people. They own more land than everybody else, but they're facing challenges because of a rising middle class, mm. specifically a merchant middle class based out of cities like Bordeaux, um, and also continual pressure um, from the political classes. And so throughout the 19th century, you see a gradual progressive move from the, the Bourbon Restoration, which is the most ultra-royalist, most pro-aristocratic group, and the aristocrats support this group, through to the, the, July, um, the July monarchy, which is more of a liberal uh, monarchy, but still a constitutional monarchy, and then into that second republic, and then the second empire. And in the second empire, one of the things Napoleon III does is reinstitute universal suffrage, right? He says, look, I'm the emperor. Everybody loves me. I'm, I'm, I'm winning every plebiscite. Uh, so that's why I can reintroduce <laughs> universal suffrage. And, and at this time, the nobility are really um, there. This is one of their weakest moments as a social class within the French, within the French system, within the French political and social system. Yeah, one of our main characters in the book is actually going through a bit of turmoil because he's discovered that his, you know, noble lineage isn't actually what he thought it was, and there's another character who's actually got the right to his lineage and all of those things. Do you think that those kind of uh, those kind of character explanations embody the class struggles that you see in that period where people aren't really sure where they belong in that social hierarchy? I, I think that that's uh, right on, and I, I think that... Um, what's important to know about the the seigneurial system and in, in the system of of nobility at that time is it's is it's hereditary. So Napoleon uh, the third reinstitutes hereditary nobility after the the second our second republic, but uh, it's not necessarily assigned to any specific privileges or or lands or monies. So for a lot of aristocrats who have maybe lost some of the previous uh, financial capital that they might have had, the special uh, political privileges, the name is what they have left, right? So it's very important to them to, to, retain, this, to retain this name in some ways. But at the same time, uh, there's the sense that nobles re still have certain kinds of social and cultural privileges. If you went into any small town in France at the time, uh, the such and such de whatever, de being of, so that's how you know to know the French noble name. If somebody has like Pierre de whatever, it means that they're Pierre of this place. That's a, a note of nobility. So they, mm -hmm. these people uh, would have still been the most important people in town. So any sense that um, maybe that person didn't belong uh, to that name, that, that would be a kind of escapist fantasy for maybe many of the readers of this book, right? Oh. I could be secretly noble, or mm. uh, maybe the people who who are running my town they don't really belong. So it's, it's yeah. got a kind of implicit criticism to it. I think one of the things that fascinates me about what you say there is the idea that you know everyone knew the famous you know dear people of in our case the de Comerin family in this town, and there was a moment earlier in the book that we were talking about that kind of seemed a little bit absurd because it's like, oh yeah, of course everyone knows everyone and everyone's connected to everyone. Would the, you know, locales in France at this time have been that small that people would know everyone? I mean, it depends on the locale. Um, Paris was quite a large city at the time, over a million people. So Paris wouldn't have had this, but most French people um, until the middle of the of the 20th century, even most French people lived in rural communes, lived in rural towns, oftentimes of fewer than 2,000 people. So they really did know everyone. Uh, and you know, for our listeners here, it might feel a little bit like knowing everybody in your little suburb, right? You might feel connected uh, to people, and everybody would know the no nobility because even at the time of the French Revolution. Nobility make up around one, one and a half, maybe two percent, around 300,000 people. And that number only decreases rather than grows. So if your town had one of these nobles, uh, everybody would know this person. They'd live in one of the biggest houses, if not the biggest house in town. Uh, they would be among the most 
well-established families, even if they don't necessarily have very much money by this time, because by the mid-19th century, many rural nobles are are um, increasingly impoverished, maybe not the poorest people in town, but not as rich as they used to be. But they had this kind of social prestige of being a noble. Uh, so everybody would know them. People would probably be a little jealous of them. They might have uh, a kind of long sense of, of, of um, wo- that they'd been wounded by the nobility, that their grandfathers had had to pay these onerous taxes and tithes to the nobility. So they probably didn't like them. And then throughout the 19th century, the no- nobles were the people who dominated politics because you had to mm. be until the Second Republic, you had to be within the top 1% of France to even be allowed to vote in the constitutional monarchy. So um, nobles weren't necessarily the most well-loved, although oftentimes liked in spite of all of this. Mm. Keith, I had a, a personal question. I wanted to know, uh, in your own words, please explain what a, a feuilleton is. A feuilleton, a feuilleton. is, is a, uh, just a kind of a, a weekly paper, yeah. uh, more or less, um, that would come out in, in, in this kind of a, a books like the one we're talking about here would come out in a serial form, mm-hmm. either um, often once a month, sometimes once a week. I don't know in, in the specific case of this book. Um, but it, it, rather than coming out all at once, because it was actually quite difficult for people to, to even still to buy books. They were expensive. Um, newspapers served a kind of more useful function. You could buy a newspaper. You could, um, you know, keep up with all of the events of the day. You could trade it. You could read it in a cafe. Um, mm-hmm. Oftentimes, if you were illiterate and in the middle of the 19th century, um, more French men and women were literate than were not, but not mm-hmm. everybody was literate. Um, you would go to a cafe and people would be reading these articles out loud. So you can imagine um, sitting around with some of your friends after work or um, you know, maybe with uh, other colleagues from around your particular little rural village reading these feuilletons um, mm-hmm. and waiting for the next edition to come out so the story would progress. And that might take a year. <laughs> So um, it's a little bit like a television show today, but not on Netflix, you know, one of the ones you have to watch every week. Yeah, I, I could imagine a, a group of, you know, young French uh, individuals sitting around discussing the Le Rouge case, trying to solve it together. Do you think that's the sort of thing you could see? Or? <laughs> I mean, I, I, uh, I don't know. I, I imagine that, that given the popularity, the growing popularity of mystery novels, uh, across Europe, um, yeah. but particularly in France and in the UK at the time, that that had to be part of the appeal, mm. um, that you could try to solve the case together. And um, I wonder in your guys' reading of the book whether you're feeling like the chapters end on cliffhangers. Like if, if, if they had broken it up the way that it was broken up in the newspaper, are there these cliffhanger endings? I, I have to admit I haven't read the book myself, so oh. I'm just providing the yeah, commentary. I mean, <laughs> one thing we did note is actually we said that a lot of the chapters read and their sections conclude a bit like scenes in a play would. Mm. And I think that what you say there about people going to cafes and hearing them read out is very reminiscent of the way it feels to read it and that structure that the story seems to have. Yeah. Maybe we should all take a break between each chapter, jot down some notes. Take some tea, maybe have a week at work, and then come back and continue reading for the the true experience of the Leroux case. <laughs> yeah, well, you have to you'd have to read it in a newspaper and <laughs> allowed to your friends. I'm sure you could find someone who owns a newspaper company. Just ask them to print it for a couple of copies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, one thing that is a very common undertone that not necessarily originates, but was one of the iconic parts of this book and. Uh, and Gaboriel's writing was the, you know, anti-authoritarian armchair detective against the police story, which kind of spread into Sherlock Holmes. We've sp- spoken a bit about the aristocracy and how the public felt about them and ridiculing them and the escapist fantasy. But when it comes to the police, where did they sit in that structure? And how does, you know, their role in the society get reflected in that, you know, anti-police kind of armchair detective role? Well, um, in fact, the police are growing exponentially during the Second Empire. Louis Napoleon III, he's very much interested in professionalizing the police force in order um, not only to kind of solve some of the urban problems that are happening in Paris, along with any city that you might have, um, crime and other, other difficulties, but also to 
in, install a kind of special police that help preserve his rule. So the police are growing at this time. They're professionalizing. They're becoming more of a militant force within French society. And, and then take yourself out to the countryside where you um, are living in these small rural villages of maybe 2,000 people total. Most people are farming uh, relatively similar uh, social class and wealth, except for maybe the aristocrat um, and a few other notables in town. Would you feel like you need a police officer there mm. to handle uh, things? No, oftentimes they felt like an imposition from the state, right? So these police officers are being sent out into the rural countryside and they're kind of reporting back to Paris what's going on. Uh, and oftentimes they were resented, but but still respected, right? So there's always this tension. Um, you, you, you didn't want them in your business, but you also, um, if you needed some someone like mm -hmm. one of these one of these uh, police, uh, you were glad to have them. So I think you you find that kind of tension fairly frequently in novels that are appearing or, or any kind of stories that are appearing during the Second Empire period, where the police presence mm -hmm. across France is really dramatically increasing. I think that that kind of almost could embody the way that we see the police in this story appear as faceless goons, aside from a few characters, the idea that it's maybe even criticizing the volume of the policing at that time, that we have, you know, so many unnamed police characters who have absolutely no role in the story, and it's highlighting just the important, just the important contributions of a few. Do you have any novels you, that you know that, you know, are inspired by the French Revolution? Anything like that? Anything? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, there's... Well, there's a trilogy of books, and I'm not going to be able to think of the title oh. of um, the books, or really the author right now, which is terrible. Right. Um, but a trilogy of books that are taking place, but take place during um, the French Revolution, but take place in Haiti, because actually Haiti, Saint-Domingue, was a colony in France and was the site of uh, the first and only successful slave rebellion uh, against um, against a, a kind of colonial oppressor. And, and all of that takes place within the context of the French Revolution because as the French are, are uh, you know, French Republicans are over in France claiming the equality of all men, all of this message is coming back to Haiti where Haiti at the time, I mentioned before these kind of merchant elites in Bordeaux, um, that's where the real money is in France at the time because one-fifth of all the wealth produced in France during the end of the 19th century is being produced in Haiti, where they're growing uh, just as much sugar as can fill all the coffee cups of Western mm. Europe, mm. and they're doing it on the back of slaves. So this is a, a society that has about 10 slaves for every non-enslaved person and has a, a kind of white landowner, uh, upper class aristocracy, a, a, a mixed race um, kind of middle class, and a, a black, poor, working slave class. And during the revolution, all these evolu revolutionary ideas about the equality of men pass through to Haiti on the ships that are traveling between France and its colonies. And um, a, a series of revolutions occur in Haiti, eventually leading to the creation of Haiti. It's at Saint-Domingue at the time, it becomes Haiti, which is the first free, uh, mm. free country, um, a free black country in, in the new world. And this trilogy of books I wish I could remember the author's name. I've met him. The books are great. Mm -hmm. They're just rippers. They're not mystery books, but man, these are some of the most thrilling um, books you could ever read about the French Revolution. All righty. So. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Keith. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thanks for having me. It's this is pleasure. Death of the Reader. We're discussing the LaRouge case, and we'll be back in just a second. If you enjoyed hearing from Dr. Keith Rathbone, you can catch more of him on the New Books Network. There's a link on the podcast. You're listening to Death of the Reader, your murder mystery world tour on 2SER. Thank you to Paul Meter for these lovely tunes that guide us towards victory each and every week. We are discussing the LaRouge case, chapters 1 to 7. I have read just those chapters, but Herds here has read everything. It's true. I've read all 20-ish chapters. We got a long way to go, but I reckon, Herds, I reckon I have this 
solved. I don't think you do. You are overconfident <laughs> to a T, to a fault, sir. I'm going to prove you wrong. And I got the scores to prove it. I got the evidence. Really? Really? Yes. All right. I'm looking forward to it. I I'm will looking say forward right to tell me what you got. My, my suspected culprit is mm. Noel or Noel, what? however it is you pronounce it. But he's just a good boy. Oh. He's just a lovely man. He lives with his with his mother, who isn't actually his mother, maybe. I just and he just wants to take care of her. That's all he wants. In the, the thing world. is, I feel like there were there are three passages that if, if I played them in quick succession right now, it would just be the damning evidence to put this man to court. What? Like, there's we we open up in chapter one. Let's let's grab let's grab our exits. Let's, let's do go it. Over. Let's go over the evidence. The widow continued. The old fellow knew the person who knocked. Her haste to open the door gives rise to this conjecture. What follows proves it. The assassin then gained admission without difficulty. He is a young man, a little above middle height, elegantly dressed. He wore on that evening a high hat. He carried an umbrella and smoked a Trebuco cigar in a holder. All right, so we have a young cigar-smoking man. Apparently. All right. Apparently. Cool. I don't know any cigar-smoking men in this novel. I, I can't even think of one. All right, let's go to no our cigars. second piece of damning evidence. Oh my goodness. Yes, there is a child, and here is its history. The widow Le Rouge, when a young woman, is in the service of a great lady immensely rich. Her husband, a sailor, probably had departed on a long voyage. The lady had a lover, found herself on Chante. She confided in the widow Le Rouge, and with her assistance, accomplished a clandestine accouchement. And let's just quickly throw in that third excerpt, nice short one. She was... Continued Noel. The slave of Madame Gurdy, devoted to her in every way. She would have sacrificed herself for her at a sign from her hand. Three. Three strikes. You're still in. Three strikes. All right. Now, listen, I know that those three on their own could be simply construed as a handful of misdirection. I would agree. But but for one simple little detail here. Mm -hmm. Throw it at me. And that is the way that Noel is described when he first enters the scene. Throw it at me, Flex. Can Can we just talk about, like... How suspicious this man is described. He's just a young man. It is absolutely ludicrous. He's just hanging out in his own home. <sighs> no. You know, in the privacy of his own abode, you can look however you want. Look, if I go home, uh, I'm lurking on my computer. I'm looking suspicious. I ain't bothering nobody. No, nah, no. Nah. Listen. All right. Listen to this. Listen to this. Without a doubt, the accident to his mother had greatly excited him, for he was very pale, and his countenance so ordinarily calm he wore an expression of profound sorrow. Yes, yeah, sorrow, because he's sad that his mother's dying. Or he's like Followed by he appeared surprised to see old Tabaret. There you go. Alright. Can we just talk about What let, let let's just talk about. You've just killed someone for the first time, Herds. What? I know you've experienced this many times, alright? I mean, yes, we're not supposed to say that on air, but okay. <laughs> You have just killed someone for the first time. Your neighbor, who you know is a detective, has showed up at your house. You don't know that. You don't know that he's a detective. No, they know They know he's a detective. They just don't know that he's working this case. I suppose so. All right. And this was the accident that his mother had just passed out for. You know, he has just seen his mother, his carer, suffer at the hands of what were probably his actions. He's just killed someone for the first time. He is, as Tabaret describes, most likely the child of this incident. And he is a young 30-something man who would fit the description and height of what was said in the earlier chapter. I, I will I will correct slightly. We, we can check this. We can check this. But I am all but certain that Tabaret is trying to hide his, his connection to the, to the police. No, you're him. absolutely right. This He's no trying way. to hide his connection to the police. Okay. But I take it that given their firm relationship, Madame mm. Jerdy or Gerdy and, uh, and Tabaret, mm. that they would at least know that he was an amateur detective. Maybe. All Maybe. right? All right. It's we'll the kind of thing. That. We'll conjecture that. They talk for so long about how close, close these people are. Mm. You're absolutely right. They do say that he's trying to hide from Noel that he's connected to the police. It's very true. I am not making any Good. argument there. Good. I'm glad we're on the same page. But I'm saying that as a neighbor of someone who is an amateur detective, you've probably discussed their cases. You probably Flex. know what they get up to in their spare time. Flex, do you know any amateur detectives? I do. His name is his name is Flex. He's that sitting doesn't count. to your right. You can't you can't <laughs> name yourself as your friend detective that you know next door. 
I'm just saying you have no experience in this regard. You don't even know. Well, maybe there's know. a second guy named Flex who lives just around the corner from me. I, and I've just impossible. never introduced you because that's... I'm concerned you'll kill him next. I don't believe that there will be next. I don't believe that there will be more than one person named Flex in this world. Okay. I just don't think it's possible. Uh... Name me kid Flex. Prove me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Send that to us on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter at Flex and Hurts. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag christening flex. Let's go. All right. Now, listen, I have laid it out. You are not turning me away from this theory. I think I think that as one of the first founding detective stories in a serialized story where we were getting this piece by piece, week by week, I think that that is a fair distribution of the culprit's motive sure. and identity. Sure, that's fine. Uh, wait, what's his motive exactly? Lay it out for me. Lay it out for me. What do you think his motive is? I believe it's something to do with the family connection. I'm still, okay. this is definitely where I'm shakier. Okay. I, I do believe that, uh, perhaps something to do with, uh, the relationship, maybe the fact that, uh, the widow LaRouge was in fact so rich and, you know, Jody and Noel are in different circumstances. Maybe there's a schism there that happened over the mm, years. Maybe. Uh, it's definitely something that I'll have to look at as we go into the later well, chapters. The, but- the thing, the thing that, that I'm curious about is that you've, you've brought up Tabaret's, you know, his conjecture, his reasoning yes. that turns out to be 100% correct, of course. Um, but he, he doesn't base this on any, any evidence from the, from the crime scene, really. Like, uh, you know, he extrapolates, but I don't know, we find evidence of, of Kid Glove and the broken foil and the, and the imprints in the mud and, all, and the weather's changed at, at, you know, at nine o'clock and all that sort of thing. Do any of those clues factor into your, your explanation at all? I mean, because I, I don't think there's any mention of being an, an accomplished swordsman. No, I, I, I definitely do think that there are there were, are weaknesses in the holes here. Mm. The the main thing that I will say is that I think that this is meant to be the kind of thing where we make Noel suspicious, then mm. in the next part of the book we're going to go make someone else suspicious, mm. and then towards the third part we're going to drag it back around to Noel. Mm. That's the way that this reads to me because there's definitely enough room presented here where Noel is given given room to not be the culprit, right? It could be just that he feels guilty that his mother's friend died. It could be mm. just that, you know, he's concerned that his detective friend might suspect him because it's a, probably a young man who carried out the case as mm. supposedly the newspaper clipping told him, mm. all right? There's all sorts of details that could let Noel off the hook. But because of the way that this is a serialized story structure, because of the way that all of these conjectures by Tabaret seem to come true, I'm willing to bet that the play here is to take the audience on a wild goose chase over the next, what is it, (laughs) 15 chapters. Yeah, 20 20 chapters total, my seven, I suppose, 13 Mm. chapters. Yeah, I mean... I would pose a slightly different theory. Oh, would you now? I'm calling it the Jerdy Shaw theory because oh, it's, no. it's Jerdy Shaw, <laughs> but it's the older Jerdy. <laughs> it's the lovely old lady who is apparently dying of a, a terrible sickness that has just uh-huh, come uh-huh. over her from, from hearing bad news. I see, I see. But I think she hired an assassin. Uh-huh. Was the assassin just null? No, of course not. Because was that, the was, assassin that would really have a point. Was the assassin maybe going to be Noel until maybe I said it? Maybe he's an accomplice. No, no, no. Maybe he's an accomplice. Maybe she, maybe he knows what his, oh. his, his mother has done. But I think there's an, another character in the novel that that fits the uh, the purview of, of a character who who knows how to sword fight, who you know has ties to, to money and influence. Mm, mm. Um, they've been introduced a little a little bit later in the novel, and that's that's Albert. Okay, it was, it was part of this whole. Uh, mix up apparently these kids have been have been been switched at birth and Albert is apparently caught up in that and I would like to to posit that um, uh, through some some circumstance uh, Mrs. Jerdy has has hired Albert said you know I'll I'll turn you I'll let all this truth out if you don't go and as- assassinate um, this this poor old widow Larouche what do you think of that Flex I will say that the thought definitely did cross my mind. I'm glad because especially it's true. It's especially true. when we got to discussions of, you know, sword combat and the broken foil and yeah. all of those things. I, I do think that that evidence lands some, neatly in your some hands. Athletic character, you know, those royalty, the people of royal blood, they're like trained to sword fight, trained to to ride horses and hunt and all that. And that's sort of nonsense. I'm just saying I don't think that Noel could could kill an old lady. I think he's just he's just not equipped. I was with you right until that sentence. 
I was I was willing to go down this path and share this journey with you. As you should. Picking between our two culprits until that decided that was going to be your key evidence. That's not my key evidence. It's just the point I decided to end on. Let's oh, I clear. see. Let's be clear. It's I see, because you couldn't actually end on anything useful is what you're telling me. Look, I've got plenty of useful stuff in there. You just gotta, you just gotta, <laughs> you just gotta listen to me. You just gotta listen to me speak. I'm just saying, old lady doesn't want the secrets getting out. Realizes, hey, we got to off this old lady, this other old lady. So it's two old ladies fighting. Is really what's at the core mm-hmm. of this novel. You know, that's why it's all about duality. I see. Um, and and so Albert is the like the the, the pair to to Noel in that he is being is being played by this old lady. I see. So you think that this is two buddy cop relationships? Yes. Going against each other. In being fact, three buddy inversely. cop relationships. Yes. So we have the, the Widow Larouge and Albert Look, going against Noel and Madame Jody, if there's and one then thing, Lecoq and Tabaret. If there's one thing that I've learned from reading this novel is it's all about relationships. That's the most important thing of this entire novel. You gotta watch out. You gotta watch out for those relationships because that's when they get you. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the other thing that I probably will bring up at this point is going back to our, our lovely... Favored friend Ronald A. Knox, hey. uh, and talking about his own assertion that many detective fiction authors would, in fact, make the first person mentioned in the entire story the culprit. Mm. Now, I will definitely say that I think the gaggle of random women that were definitely first mentioned, Dude, those are the other accomplices. They like they're the ones who sniffed her out. They were like, "M. Journey, we found this old lady. She says that you're the the mother of this other child, and that there was switched at birth." And she's like, "Oh." And that's how it started. I mean, again, not terribly and they put on clergy outfits but and stuck the way into the house. The, the, and- the point, the point that I was going to drag along to was the fact that Noel is the first young man mentioned in the story, other than the random messenger boy. The messenger boy, yes, who is explicitly told that the truth shall come to light. Yes, I'm just saying, foreshadowing, <laughs> foreshadowing. That's what that's what Doc says. He says all these rules. Unless foreshadowing. That's Ooh, that's how it works. Yeah, you're right, you're right. So that young boy who's like, I'm gonna get the man with the earrings. We we haven't even talked about, by the way. There are apparently some other characters who've been who've been visiting uh the Widow Luge. Do you suspect any of those? You think they're accomplices? The man with the earrings in particular might be might be an interesting one. I'm, Jeff I'm, Roll ran after him. I'm definitely trying to think like how effectively each of these characters is going to be used because obviously they're all introduced and they're all given some specific character descriptions. Earrings and the sunburn and all that sort of thing. Yeah, so I feel as though they're going to end up being important, but considering that we are in the early part of the story and that our assertion when we declare what chapters we're going to read is that the early part of the story should contain the necessary clues to solve the puzzle, I do believe that the necessary clues to solve the puzzle exist within chapters one to three and are refined up to chapter seven. Mm, when we nice. talk about being swapped at birth, when we talk about, you know, the connection and finances and history of the two women and Albert and Noel, you know, that, that's all of the details that'll let us figure out the why. I'm still a little torn on what specifically those are, but mm. I do think that we have what we need. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, I suppose we'll we'll have to see what happens then. I'm just saying, old ladies they make better me, better murderers in general because they got more they got more fighting them. They got more more experience. They all right, kill a man. All right, all right. What Two chapters strikes. are we reading up to next week? Uh, we're reading up to the end of chapter fourteen. So get your get your books ready, get your detective notebooks, and and read along. All right, we're going to chapter fourteen, everyone. We'll see you then. In the meantime, I've brought in a broken foil into the are studio. You, are you kidding me? No, no. So what we're going to do between this week and next week is we're going to try to recreate the crime in the room. Okay. All right? Sounds good. So I'm going to be Albert. Uh Uh-huh. You're going to be the Widow LaRouge. Okay. And if you're not on the show next week, that means I've killed you, and thus you were right. If you're alive next week, it it means I was right. It's a small sacrifice, but one I am willing to make. (laughs) Let's go! (laughs) And that was part one of the LaRouge case. Hope you enjoyed. But yeah. we're not done here, Herds. Oh, what, this isn't the end? No, there's still two more parts oh to go. Oh my goodness, a whole two-thirds of the show to go. Exactly. If that's about how it cuts out, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This time around, we're talking chapters 8 to 14, which is a, a, bit, a bit of a confusing one, because mm. it seems that our culprit's been caught straight away. 
Well, obviously, it's just the, the author giving us a bone, right? Throwing things out the window, getting things wrapped up nice and early. Why even have a third part at this point? I suppose you're right. Mm. I suppose the people will have to listen and find out. Yeah. We're well, going to talk about the, the vampire count himself. Mm-hmm. We're going to talk about all of the wild and confusing clues found in Albert's home, which seem to implicate him in the crime. And what is this closed circle? And mm. is there one at all? Is there one? We're also going to be having theatre expert Andrew Fallon on to talk about all sorts of film subjects, which, as we all know, is what we brought him on for. So, look forward to that. Yes, and then coming (laughs) up in the final part, can Herds dissuade me from the fact Noel is the culprit, or is it in fact Albert, as the police suspect? Mm -hmm. I'm just tingling with anticipation at Flex. This is part two of the extended cut here on Death of the Reader. You're listening to Death of the Reader, your murder mystery world tour on 2SCR. We are Flex and Her, talking about chapters 7 to 14 of the Le Rouge case by Emile Gaboyo. We have the arrest of a young man, the plight of a heartbroken magistrate, and a vampire. A vampire? You heard me correctly, a vampire. I do not remember there being a vampire that factors into this story. He has the the dark the darkened carriage. He has a mansion. He has a son who barely sees him. He is Count de Comerin. Right. A vampire. Okay, I see what we're getting at here. <laughs> is that not what you were picturing the entire time? I like mean, the drawn I guess, back face? I guess I was. He's over. He's I suppose. Like, yes, my son, let me groom you. Yes, let me tell you about our family's dark secret. You are. And then he says, are you, she's not my mother. He's like, yes, that that was the secret all along. I see, even though we've had it already revealed to us and it was entirely anticlimactic. Yes. I'm not going to be able to see the Viscount any other way now. Yeah, as the son of a vampire. <laughs> <laughs> now, obviously, we still haven't gotten much better at pronouncing French words, so apologies once again. Falks pass. But yes, uh, the LaRouche case by Emile Gaboriau, mm. as a Australian person would do their best to pronounce it without trying. <laughs> Wait, look, why don't you try it? We're doing You're doing here. your best. I'm, I'm you. barely, barely hey, even... Before we go to air... Let's be very clear. I pull up YouTube and I type how to pronounce and then I put in the word and then I just I just say it. I tend to use Google Translate to see how to pronounce I mean, words. That's that's fine too, but YouTube has some very good resources. Oh, or yeah. if you should check it out online. My Jean my Dyer. favorite is when Google Translate's like automatic, you know, pronunciation guide will just not pronounce a syllable at all and you're like was that a glitch is that how they actually pronounce i don't know that's the fun part language it's crazy but But yeah yeah. let's let's talk about (laughs) let's talk about the floating the floating admiral oh my god tangents aside get that out of here (laughs) let's talk about the larouge case Mm, yeah so this story i think has perhaps been the thematically most consistent going oh, through of the books we've covered it. so far. This is my kind of murder mystery novel where the mystery is like not as important as just jamming it out with the characters, feeling their emotions, watching M. Deberon, his his heartbreak and, and the Count's trying to cover up his past lies. It's beautiful. This is my kind of drama. Yeah, I think that a lot of the things that we said last week about this book are still true now. Yeah. Some of the other books we've covered uh, have very much had a massive stylistic difference between the start and the end. This one doesn't seem to be going through much of a change. No, no. It's um, it's firmly focused on this this close circle, this core group of characters, which is excellent. Um, and we're slowly unveiling the kind of the mystery of, not, not just of, of the murder that we're, we're experiencing, but of the aristocracy. Um, one of my favorite parts of the book is how Emilio, he's kind of poking fun at these, these well-to-do rich types. We had it a little bit with, with Juliet in the last chapter and, and um, uh, the Marchioness. But again, with the Count, he, he complains that the poor people, the people with you know, no money, the, the lower class, are the smart ones. You know, While we're sitting back earning X number of francs a year doing nothing, they're out there doing their work, doing their fair share. They're the smart ones for working and earning an income that is not based on their family name and nothing else. Like they're the, they're the intelligent ones. Yeah, definitely. It's such a silly like rant that he goes on. Um, and, and Albert in this, this chapter isn't really paying attention to it because he's thinking about, you know, the revelations that he's, that he's found, but yeah, I, I love the count. I'm sorry. That must be apparent by now, but he's my favorite character in the book. I think I, I'm not incredibly familiar with the like history of this book with the you know French Revolution mm. being yes. 60 ish years before, but yes. I, well, I feel that there are still f- like feelings left over from those incidents. Absolutely. And in fact, there, there are more revolutions that have been since then. There was one in 1848, which is all about like worker rights. 
um, the right to to work in in France and it being a, a standardized thing. Like this novel is very much based in that culture in in France, which I really like. It, you know, how we're a murder machine world tour show. You know, we go around. It really feels like we're getting a, a French novel. Like French Revolution is very much a core part of that culture and that history. Um, and it's clear that it was you know in the mind of the author when he wrote this. Um, write about how the aristocracy is seeing a, a decline. And in fact, the the kind of difference between the, the upper and, and lower classes is starting to become, you know, uh, less less apparent. Like, they, you know, their, their income is going down and there's always concern about money and all that sort of thing. Um, we very much see these, these older characters, the Marchioness and the Count, being humanized through this novel and also being made fun of, which I, I love it. I love it so much. It does also fascinate me with that point made that with so much turmoil going on politically yes. in France at the time, the fact that the novel stays consistent, even though things probably would have changed politically between the release of the first chapter and the release of the last chapter probably. as it was released episodically, yeah. it's really surprising and impressive that it manages to maintain as such a consistent tone. Yeah, it's really good. I uh, I got to give a shout out to my boy Emil. Um <laughs> I think the one thing I did want to question you on there, though, was your mention of the closed circle. Oh, yeah? We've spoken a bit about locked rooms. We've spoken a bit about impossible crimes. But I will very much dispute the fact that this is a closed circle. For those of you unfamiliar with the concept, all it means is basically that we're dealing with a limited group of characters. We are absolutely not dealing with a limited group of characters here. Yeah, I mean, you're right. In terms of solving the mystery, we are having more characters be introduced as we go on from chapter to chapter, and that's part of the serialized nature of it. Um, I, I guess I was more thinking in terms of trying to, to solve the culprit because that the concept of the closed circle, that there's, you know, this is 10 people on an island and they're all trying to figure out who's killed everyone. It's got to be one of the 10 people, you know, that's what very, very Agatha Christie. Um, this isn't quite that. We have a whole city to explore. Um, and we even go outside of the city, or, or at least Tabaret does on his his swift horse with his 12 apostles of the apocalypse um, that he just rides out with. Um, but certainly in terms of finding the culprit, I think we should fall back on, on Knox's idea that the criminal should be introduced in the first five chapters or so of the novel. Um, but yeah, you're right. We are very much going out and, and finding characters. I mean, we end chapter 14 with a note from Javel saying that he's found... The, the man with the earrings, someone with the, the most valuable testimony. Um, and apparently that's going to be relevant somehow. I don't know who you think that is, but hey, they could be like the most important witness in the entire case or something. Wouldn't Maybe that be crazy? Maybe it could be. Maybe who it could knows? be. But he has been introduced at least when he does it's show true. up. He has been mentioned. I think that the thing with Knox's rules, which as always, there's a rundown on the podcast if you want to check that out. Go check it out. Uh, is that when it says the culprit must be introduced in the early part of the story, it's mm. saying that even if you don't have a closed circle, it should still be a closed circle. Sure. That even if everyone can move around and be free in mm. theory, you should still have played it fair by the audience by keeping yeah. it within a certain scope. Yeah. And I like I want to say I trust this novel, and <laughs> I think given the theory that I have, I do trust this novel. Yeah. But considering that the you know, standards for the genre hadn't been laid out as much as they were by the time Knox was around. I think that there's definitely a lot more room to maneuver from Gaboriau's perspective. Yeah, there definitely is. There, there are definitely, um, I think we are not in the third part yet, but mostly in the third part of this story, we're going to see some things happen that don't make any sense and that definitely were not foreshadowed at all. Um, but we'll get to that when we get there. Um, but yeah, Emil has, I mean, he has an entire city to play around with. And again, due to the serialized nature of the, the Fulitons, um, he has to keep coming up with new characters and new interesting things to pull in and to, to upset the narrative and to, to take us on a, an emotional roller coaster and set up cliffhangers. Um, and I think that's fine. Uh, and that might be a controversial thing to say, especially on a, on a murder mystery podcast where we have, you know, a segment dedicated to Knox's commandments, but simply because this was written so long ago, I think there's a certain charm to it. I think that even in the, in the parts of the novel where um, stuff kind of comes out of nowhere, I find it fun. I find it interesting to look back on. I don't feel particularly cheated by this murder mystery. And I think that's because it's not mm, super complicated. Um, like we've had the scene where we've, we've gone to Albert and we've, we've found all of the evidence in his room and we've arrested him and locked him away. So well, obviously, talk about your theories a little bit more in the third part, but it seems pretty cut and dry, honestly. 
We absolutely will. Um, but I do think that as a closing thought on that particular bubble, that this is an example of how you can do a not close circle mystery well while still being very distinct about who's in the uh, the 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 bubble. <laughs> the suspect se. ellipses. The, um, <laughs> the, the partially opened circle. Yeah, sure. The semicircle of, of culprits and mm. uh, suspects and such. Yeah, for sure. I think the other thing that was particularly fascinating about what we were presented in chapters 7 to 14 was uh, Albert's house. Yeah, what about it? About his house. It's it was just fantastic. Like, that they, they, they're they like, oh, Albert's gone. We get to seal off that wing and you can have another wing, Noel, all that stuff. Or? I just I just love that it's like, you know, I was talking last episode about how Noel came onto the scene and it was just so immediately suspicious. And Albert was kind of less so. Mm. But then this time around, we walk in and it's like, oh, it's the murder weapon that was described. Oh, hey, it's a pair of muddy pants when the culprit arrived before it rained and then yeah. left after it rained. Yeah, I mean, that's the fun thing about this novel is that they just they just give you the culprit right away. It's uh, pretty handy, really. It's mm-hmm. a, I wish more mur- murder mysteries did that. They just give you all the evidence that you need to convict the first suspect that we're really given in the book. I was already kind of suspicious of Albert <laughs> given given the kind of you know, family mess that's going on. It's great. It's very aristocracy. I love it. But when we got to his house and just the foil was there, I was just like, oh, God, Mm. was I just completely wrong? Although, to be fair, they can't find the tip, so who knows? I mean... Well, the valet can't find the tip. Let's be be specific here. It doesn't seem to be that important. Mm, Who knows? (sighs) That's the fun part, isn't it? Finding the murder weapon, or at least part of it. That's the main thing, really. I think that the murder weapon itself not to say anything about the previous story specifically but this is perhaps the most distinct like story that we've had where the mm. murder weapon has appeared as a clue yeah sure the ones we've covered so far it's basically just been like oh yeah here's the murder weapon i mean it's a very specific weapon right like if we're talking about a foil it is a fencing weapon it like it can only be you know used by someone or you know in the context of the story it is going to be used by someone who who fences um fencing is like an athletic sport, so it's probably, you know, like, we get more clues out of it than just, it was a gun. Like, anyone can point a gun and pull the trigger. Well, I actually want to kind of correct you on that a little bit, because I believe that this was still in the era where fencing was more of a honors duels kind of thing rather than so. just an athletic competition. I suppose. So it's more about uh, nobility then, sorry, I should say, than about athleticism. Well, not only that, but I think that it also gives us a clue as to the motive in mm. the very first chapter. The fact that it is a foil that Tabaret predicts as the weapon mm. gives us a hint that this is a love-based motive because, sure. you know, that's what the that's what fencing originated as. Mm, I suppose so. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, it's fun. Like, I like that we get given a, a distinct murder weapon, a signature murder weapon, you might say. Um, it's the sort of thing you, you know, you pick up, you pick up a, a serialized, you know, murder novel and then there's someone who keeps using, you know, the, the horn of a goat. He lays, he puts it on the victim's forehead after he's killed them, you know? And so he gets to know, like, this is the person who used the, the horn of a goat and puts on his victims, um, like a calling card. It's not quite the same thing, but I, I definitely appreciate it's not just a knife or a gun. Um, unless it was a very specific kind of gun. I do think that in, you know, 19th century France, a foil yeah. may have been a bit more common than it is today. You know what? It's interesting to us, I think. I, I don't know. Well, that's, I think that's part of the fun as well of reading something from the, you know, the 19th century is that we, like we have records, and but we don't live in that time. We don't know what, how it'd be. Mm, I mean, I feel as though you've probably been a bit misled as to the commonality of you know, fencing weapons when we have a stash of them in the corner of the studio here. Oh my goodness, why are those there? Well, we can get into that later when we once again reenact the crime. Oh no. But I have to keep a stash of them on hand for when they come up as weapons. I see, I see. You're a master uh, fencer after all. (laughs) Coming up on the show, we'll be talking a bit more about those theories and what uh, what that little reenactment will do for us. But right now, we have... Acclaimed military leader Napoleon Bonaparte. <laughs> you really? Oh, well, goddamn you! Uh, just leave, just leave that in. Just forget to cut that out. I won't forget. I'll just leave it in on purpose. I know it'll be good. It's the kind of thing that's going to go into the new extended cut. Hello, new extended cut audience. <gasps> welcome, welcome. How's to us? How treating you? Or YouTube? 
wherever you are. Wherever it is you are. Let us know on at Flex and Hurt, Instagram, <laughs> Twitter, and Facebook. <laughs> Take that one off the list. <laughs> Welcome to Facebook. I was about to do it next time, and I'm like, wait, that's the wrong show. Next time. You're listening to Death of the Reader on 2SCR. This is Flex and Herds, and today we are joined by Mr. Andrew Fallon, published playwright of DDUSB, upcoming indie play producer, and self-proclaimed friend of the show. Here to shine a Wait, spotlight on the main act. What? Self-proclaimed friend of the show? That's what I said. Here to shine How a does spotlight. Work? Here to shine a spotlight <laughs> on the main act. <laughs> the LaRouge case. How are you today, Andrew? Yeah, not too bad. Just uh Hanging out with my self-proclaimed friends, <laughs> as, as one usually does. I appreciate you coming on here. I hope you're doing well today. The novel that we're studying, the the Lerouge case, it mm-hmm. uh, it has a, a very theatrical feel to it, with a strong kind of emphasis on you know, long periods of dialogue back and forth, mm. and it almost reads as, as stage directions for actors throwing themselves about the space. Um, I was just wondering, what's uh, what's the difference between writing for a play as opposed to a novel, like? Um, you, there's a huge difference. Tell um, me, tell the me about huge it. difference. So um, the thing about a novel is that it is read. The thing about a play is that it's watched. Mm. You watch a play. Like uh, when you're reading Shakespeare, like I know a lot of people read Shakespeare in high school and they just don't gel with it at all. Um, they're like, you know, I don't understand the language. I understand what's actually happening here. But when you watch Shakespeare, um, like you know, maybe you read Macbeth in high school, when you watch Macbeth uh, on stage, um, a lot you can infer so much just from the actors' gestures and their and like the, the use of soliloquy and their stage mm. presence um, and just what um, how they react to one another and it just becomes that much more alive. Um, but Shakespeare is a particularly good example because Shakespeare was written for peasants who couldn't mm. read. Um, and like we are educated 21st century um, like laymen in m- many cases but like <laughs> point is with a peasant equivalent point is we can read at least um, <laughs> we're, we're smarter than a, than a, than a like you know a 16th century peasant mm. um, one would hope yeah <laughs> <laughs> do you think a detective fiction benefits at all from this change in, uh, in uh, script writing and in tone uh, yeah, I think detective fiction actually lends itself really well to theatre. Yeah. Um, detective fiction already has sort of, sort of a, it's very performative mm-hmm. in and of itself. You're always uh, following this um, sort of character, this uh, sort of kind of not omniscient, but very like sort of like outside a knowledgeable character, whether it's like Sherlock Holmes uh, or it's Poirot or whatever, like uh, sort of this sort of outsider character who seems to know, seems to clue in very well what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, and that kind of like dynamic as they're sort of going through this rogues gallery of cast of suspects mm. um, just like breeds all this interesting sort of um, performativeness as you mm. explore like how different people react to one another and how they operate under pressure. It's, it's, detective fiction is already quite focused on characters and it can be quite focused on dialogue mm. um, because you know, get the, the, the interrogations and you've got all that kind of stuff and you're, you're trying to sort of like, you know, suss out who's the villain um, in, in the story or if there even is one, <laughs> you're going to get very subversive. Um, yeah. It gels super well um, blending like theatre elements. I mean, there, there are plenty of adaptations of theatre, of, mm. like, of, of detective fiction to theatre. Like Sherlock Holmes' Speckled Band I've seen ad- adapted and that looked really good on stage. Um, and uh, and uh, Poirot is like always has that kind of stuff. I mean, even when you watch like um, you know the Agatha Christie's Poirot like series and like ABC or whatever, it's 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 staged in a lot of ways like a, a players where it's um you don't have all these big flashy set pieces. Um, uh, uh, you have these very intimate close up shots a lot of mm. characters sort of being interrogated, being grilled, and you see them reacting, and you're like you know maybe they're cool and calm. And it's mm. like ooh. Uh, and um, a lot of and character drama portrayed through the specific kind of uh, play directed directions of the of the author, um, but in this case the director in the terms of a play, right? Yeah, in, in, in a sense, yes. But there's also, I mean, there's there's two entities in a in a, in a play, as I suppose there are in um, mm. in a film, where you there's the director and the author, and they're different, they're separate entities. Of course, of course. Um, sometimes they're the same, um, where someone will like write something and then direct their own um, work. Go back to the Shakespeare example, uh, like you can get twenty different directors put on a Shakespeare production and it'll be 20 different shows even if it's the same thing mm-hmm. um, like you know I, I've seen heaps of different adaptations of like Midsummer Night's Dream um, and every time there's something interesting to look at something surprising whether they change the genre mm-hmm. of it so like maybe it's Midsummer Night's Dream but it's like steampunk or Midsummer Night's Dream but like it's set in the modern day yeah. um, or like you know it's, it's centered around some like you know working class stiffs um, or it focuses on a particular element like might focus on the actors or the fairies or something like that how do you think that when you're approaching adapting a story like that you balance keeping true to the source material for you as the screen for you as the playwright and you as the director versus you know putting your own interpretation on it adaptations are an interesting case 
Um, when in terms of like playwriting, like say adapting, if I was to adapt like Sherlock Holmes or something like that, I actually have written an adaptation. It was on Herbert West Reanimator, which is a H.P. Lovecraft short story. Mm. Um, I find a common pitfall for amateur writers adapting a um, like a short story or a novel or something to play form is it becomes very reliant on monologues. Uh, where, like, you know, take mm. any your average story is usually written, if it's especially in the first person perspective, they'll just be like, this paragraph from the play, from the from the story, is just what they say. Yeah. Um, and I would say, under, if you're going to do that kind of thing, understand why you're doing that because you don't want to just make it an audio book. <laughs> yeah. Um, you don't just want to say what the play things. You kind of want to find the beats that make it interesting. Um, and if you want, like, sort of exaggerate certain elements that would work better for stage. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the first thing that jumps to mind when I think of that is, you know, obviously we're talking about detective fiction and the detective mm. will walk into a room and say, this is a clue, this is a clue, this is a clue, this is who's mm. guilty and whatnot. I mean, that's the interesting thing about um, theatre in particular is that uh, because you've, only, you've got this limited stage space, you don't have all these different sets like you do in film. You can have it, but um, it's... For amateur theatre especially, it's it's a lot uh, less manageable because um, you don't want to like have a whole bunch of scene changes take like five minutes each because then it just kills the pacing. Um, but uh, with a like st- stage, like say you've got like a, a Sherlock Holmes detective thing, it takes place all inside this like one office and they're investigating mm. that maybe. And there might might be a scene outside where they like have a little corner of the theatre where it's like, oh, we're out here and we're by the docks and there's the man by the docks um, or something like that. But um, with with visual clues, you can have them all like. On, on stage yeah. um, maybe showing up at different times maybe there's like a gun under the desk or like you know there's something some character like you know sneaks in and he like you know he pulls a book uh, off a uh, like you know off a bookcase and it's a secret compartment and they walk in um, but like the, 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 with um, detective fiction the, the clues are sort of being told to you like um, you sort mm-hmm. of you pick it up in the writing and on what's being emphasized and what's being intentionally obscured um, with theatre it's much more visual uh, I was just wondering if you could tell us a bit about your script writing process there sir uh, so script writing process, that's an interesting kind of one. Mm. Um, it's a very broad subject. So um, do, do you have any specific things that you want to discuss about writing a script? I was just curious. I know you have a, a play coming up, which we'll get into a little bit later. Mm-hmm. I was just curious about the, the process for writing a character or writing a scene, um, maybe the structure of your plays, anything you'd like to talk about there? Well, in, in terms like? of structure, you, you sort of start off with like, you find an idea that you think is interesting and you kind of like, well, I want to write a play about that. Mm. Um, for DDUSB, for instance, it's like, um, I wanted to write a play that was basically just like cyberpunk, like Netrunner or something like that and make a play out of it. And then I did that. Um, <laughs> and you sort of get your overarching sort of scaffold as to like how you, what, what kind of themes you want to explore, what kind of, how the story's going to kind of play out. Um, a lot of it's, uh, you sort of just pick up a lot of it as, as you start writing. You sort of like, mm. you sort of thinking of this character. It's like, oh, this could be an interesting dynamic between this character and this character. Um, and you sort of start sort of piecing it together and um, the creative juices start flowing and you really get some, uh, like a cohesive piece. You mentioned that you were writing, you've written a play and published it. It's about cyberpunk. Do you mm. use any sort of media touchstones for that? As in like genre conventions? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, I mean, I suppose I do. Um, the g- genre is a very useful um, element of, um, of, of, of fiction. Um, it's, it, it's, it's at its worst when it's used as like a crutch where it's like, you know, it's a Western, so we got to do everything the Western movie does, or it's a superhero mm-hmm. thing, we do everything superheroes do. Um, and use that's best when you understand the, the conventions and why they exist in a certain um, genre. So, for example, like um, cyberpunk, dystopia is a big um, genre. Mm-hmm. Um, um, transhumanism is yeah. a very big one. Um, I, I feel often a lot of cyberpunk things, uh, a, a good example, not quite cyberpunk, but sci-fi, um, Detroit Become Human, mm-hmm. um, they tend to sort of cop out on the transhumanism and make it more about the civil rights movement. Right, um, right. And I think that's, in the 21st century, that's less interesting. Mm. There's more stuff you can touch on. So like um, you can touch on, for example, like, you know, uh, trans people. Um, that's, that's a big topic, 21st century, like, you know, a hot button political issue. Um, mm-hmm. And cyberpunk is, as implied by the word punk, is uh, very good at criticizing the system. Yeah, fair enough. I was just curious about your process. We, uh, I was just thinking about the the Robert Downey Jr. Sherlock Holmes adaptation, which, which we all you do a lot, not love, which I do, yeah, <laughs> because it's you know not a great detective movie, no. but it's a fun adaptation. Um, the scenes when he's you know putting together usually how to disarm or disable someone quickly and efficiently, but this sort of thing where we have those those montages, those snapshots in Holmes' mind, saying, and then I you know pop his rib, and then I grab him from behind, and then I push him over the waterfall or whatever. Um, you could use that sort of thing in a play, I imagine, through this little snapshot of the detective's thinking, but in, an, in a more entertaining way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, the the sort of go-to for um, getting inside someone's head for really sort of like focalizing yes. on a character in, in, in theater is usually through soliloquy or monologue. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and, and so they can, you know, they can sort of reveal their intentions where it's like, aha, now I'm going to do this thing. Or it's like, ah, now my plan has begun. Mm. Uh, or with the same case of Sherlock, like, you know, he could just sort of be cluing all these pieces together in his mind. And it's like, and then there's the case regarding the speckled band. And, oh, it's a snake. Oh, spoilers. Uh, it's a snake. Spoilers? Um, <laughs> 
Oh my goodness, I haven't even read that I one. guess we'll have to avoid that story now. I think the <laughs> other thing that's interesting to me about balancing from a detective fiction perspective, like stage, film, and the book, is that with a book and the stage, you can be a lot more picky about what you put in the scene, what you describe, what you put on the stage. Mm. Whereas when we get to film, it's, mm. a lot harder, it's a lot harder to have that adaptation of where dressing is set with the things that are relevant. Mm. Like if we look around this room that we're recording in right now, there are hundreds of things that are absolutely irrelevant to what's going on in the yes. story that we're telling on air here, mm. but they're still part of the scene. And that's not something that you can be as liberal with um, on stage and in a book. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, I mean, with film, you've got cinematography, which is um, mm. like, th th that's the thing about when you make any adaptation, when you're doing anything in any medium, un understanding the medium is essential to that, crucial. Um, and with film, understanding cinematography just makes that much more of a difference. Like, you look at a, a, a blandly made film, and it's always like shot, reverse shot, um, two actors like talking to each other, maybe there's like a wide angle shot to establish a scene, and it's all very, it, it doesn't use the medium to its advantage. Whereas in a detective fiction, you could absolutely lose, use the medium to your advantage. Um, like, you know, you could have close ups on these sort of like clues, or um, you could have uh, like, you know, certain uh, angles, like a high angle shot, which reveal like someone might have a higher status or something like that, mm. or um, like sort of might make a character come across as more menacing just by the way you're shooting the uh, the shot. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's, that's one big advantage to film. Um, I, th I think an example of like, getting a bit too cheeky with the cinematography um, to try and like leave the clues. It's, it's curiously enough not even detective fiction. It's actually um, the uh, for the Final Destination films. I, was, I watched one of the earlier films. Uh, one, sorry, I watched one of the later films. Uh, Final Destination 5, I think it was. And every single time, if, you, if you're not familiar with the series, basically, it's like, everyone's going to die in some contrived way. Um, and so every, every um, scene plays out where they start off every scene uh, in, in a parallel universe where the engineers are all completely inept, um, and mm. so like it'll zoom in on like you know they're at like a like a like gymnastics thing, and they'll zoom in on like uh, like you know the chairs, the, the benches are all like wobbly, and like there's a screw loose over here, and there's a guy on on a, on a broom, he's like sweeping along, and maybe the broom's gonna kill them somehow. But basically, it just shows all these clues, and every single time without fail, the answer is always the thing that's really innocuous that they don't mm. bother to focus on. You know, I couldn't imagine a worse death than a, a death by broom. Maybe just by spork. If you choked uh, on a spork, that'd be pretty bad. It's so stupid. Um, like, there's one where it's like, I'm getting eye surgery, and the water cooler was what killed them. Mm. <laughs> the water cooler that, like, they play, gave barely any, like, reference to at the very start, and it's like, oh, it's the water cooler, okay. <laughs> Everything else has been given, a, like, a five-second close-up to, like, foreshadow it. It's the water cooler. This is, this is dumb. Uh, and that's what bad detective fiction does. <laughs> I see. Enough. It's the water cooler it, 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 detective fiction. It, 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 yeah. it, it, it'd be subversive, but not in a clever way. It's just being subversive for its own sake. Mm -hmm. um, I know we're getting a bit off topic, but like that's that's kind of what bad detective fiction does. Where it's like uh, a big example. Have you guys seen Sherlock? Which which, which one? one? Uh, the the, the uh, what's his face? Um, the BBC. Benedict Cumberbatch. Benedict Cumberbatch. He has. Yeah. Flex has. Uh, yeah, like uh, Sherlock, it gets even worse about that. Where it doesn't even sh like even hint at the thing that happens. It just just Sherlock just discovers it through some contrived nonsense. Where it's like it was a boomerang. That was spoilers. never shown prior to this. Spoilers. Boomerang spoilers. I uh, trust me, that moment does not need spoilers. does not need Look, a spoiler warning. It's, in a, it's a this mess. Yeah. Inflammatory internet culture, we cannot tolerate spoilers. And that's okay? that's a, that's a common thing I found in bad tech division, is that either they will just pull something like out of their butt. Um, like towards the end, where it's like it was this all along, and the, and 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 the, the big advantage of detective fiction in any uh, medium is that it's a puzzle, mm -hmm. uh, and that it intrinsically engages the audience. They yeah. want to try and solve it before the detective does. Should be fair play to exactly, solve. Exactly, fair course. play. Um, mm -hmm. And when you're writing detective fiction, um, that's something you got to sort of factor in if you want it to be well written. Is that you got to plant these clues in. Uh, where they're subtle enough that not literally everyone will predict it from the very start, mm. um, but they're not like so obscured um, that they're either like they're virtually non-existent. Have you written any, maybe not detective <laughs> fiction, but mysteries in your in your play work, sir? Uh, I mean, there was an element of mystery when I wrote Herbert West. Um, mm. I actually framed it as a detective fiction. Okay. Um, so like because Herbert West is is, is episodic, mm -hmm. um, it's like serialized. It's like so it, it cuts to these different moments in Herbert West's life. Uh, where he's um, basically trying to reanimate the dead. Um, and the way I sort of connected those all is that there's these interim scenes where there's this detective interrogation room and it plays out like a detective um, fiction where you're, where you're trying to work out, rather trying, not trying to work out who like the, 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 the villain is, but you're trying to work out the reliability of the um, narrator's story. Mm -hmm. um, because that's the whole thing about um, Lovecraft, is that it's all like, like, like questioning sanity and questioning what's real and what isn't. Mm. Um, and and for the case when I was writing that, I added these detective fiction elements to it to um, not not make it a detective fiction, 
but to um, add that sort of mystery, that extra layer mm. where it's like how much of what we're being told and being shown is an, ac- is an accurate account mm-hmm. and how much of it can be attributed to um, like in you know, a madness or to um, just like sort of um, like, you know, just the, 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 fra- the, the fragility yeah. of the human mind. It's always a fun uh, narrow device where the puzzle isn't just, you know, is what we're... It, what is the answer to the mystery, but also how many of these clues are reliable? How many of these clues can we actually use? Mm. Um, that sort of thing. I think an unreliable narrator can work quite well in detective fiction. Mm. It's, it's not a common thing because usually the, the, the like, you know, the, the focalizer is the narrator. Uh, not the narrator, sorry, the, uh, the detective. Um, and the detective is typically competent. Typically. Typically the, the detective is competent. Um, there are some subversions to that. Um, for example, like, uh, it's like in, early, in early detective fiction, actually, like around the time of um, of uh, Arthur Conan Doyle. Um, the yeah. Well, the, the Watson's also not incompetent, though. The, the Watson's actually quite smart. He's the educated layman. Mm. Mm. Um, Watson is almost like the uh, audience surrogate character yeah. where like the average reader will be following at Watson's speed. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's one thing that we spoke about many times with Knox's rules is that one of the core foundations of a set of tenets for early detective fiction was mm. that the Watson should be dumber but just slightly than the reader so that they never mm. feel like they're being spoken down to exactly. by the Watson. Um, yeah, that's absolutely the case for that kind of thing. Um, but for like early detective fiction with Arthur, Co- like around Arthur and Dolia, there were some writers um, who like played around the idea of the incompetent detective mm. where rather than like using their savvy and their wit they just kind of bumbled around mm. and eventually got to the answer yeah. um, it was met poorly at the time and it often can be met quite poorly look at Holmes and Watson yeah, yeah. I will um, say having an incompetent detective is an ill-advised because then they just run around circles and then they fall down that's what well, happens well I mean it's true but you can have an incompetent detective and still have them as someone who can get stuff done uh, like mm. get smart yeah, I mean, even example, in uh, even in the LaRouge case, which we're covering at the moment, Lecoq, who went on to become Gaborio's most famous detective, has been described by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle as a bumbling idiot. And it's not necessarily because he's incompetent, but it's because a lot of the ways that he stumbles across things and, you know, reasons his way in circles doesn't really make much sense. Mm. Mm. I mean, that's the thing. Is that, um, that's, that's, like, that's like the worst part of, like, bad detective fiction. Um, is when you've got the detective who is just like babbling on and something that doesn't make any sense but is somehow correct. You're talking about how each director and each playwright will make a very different product from the same kind of source material yeah. and that the strongest point of detective fiction is the puzzle. Mm. But as we've said, obviously some adaptations abandon that. Do you think there's a way that abandoning the core tenets of a genre or a medium can still be wrought to work by playing with it in unique ways, and how, how would you maybe approach that? Uh, I'd say yes, absolutely. Um, the thing about genre is that you shouldn't feel constricted by it. So genre does have strictures and sort of like um, elements that define something as a genre, but you shouldn't feel like that you have to follow all the core tenets of that of that genre to be sort of true to that kind of thing. Um, and if you, if you understand the workings of something, you can w- work out how to sort of bend the rules. Um, like there aren't really, I mean, you can argue there are like rules to the rules to like writing a good story. Um, but I, I'd say there aren't necessarily, there aren't necessarily rules to writing a good story, but if there were rules, understand why you're breaking them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's like, obviously like show, don't tell is a big thing, um, in, in story writing. Um, but if you wanted to, you could write a story that's very tell, don't show, but it'd be terrible unless you had a good understanding of why you're doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, and for the case of genre. Um, you can really, you can really deviate and be subversive. Like take the, um, the uh, like the uh, Robert Downey Jr. Um, Sherlock Holmes, where it's an action movie. It's it's not a detective movie, but it has detective elements in it because it's it is playing with those um, that sort of Sherlock kind of stuff. And it and it does that to in a way make the um, action just a bit more um, not clever, <laughs> but um, just it, it's just an interesting aesthetic to sort of throw onto the action where it he's is. like describing all the fight scenes yeah. and, and the slow mo and all that. And having this like sort of combat savvy protagonist who isn't just like a meathead, um, they're actually quite smart. Mm-hmm. Um, with the, with the case of Sherlock, whereas your average action hero is usually like a either like a beefcake, like like Dolph Lundgren or something, yeah. uh, or it's like it's it's like you know, you you every man like like Die Hard with John McClane. Yeah, I think it strikes a nice balance in that a lot of detectives can feel like overly pompous and smart and mm. be a step above the reader, whereas by portraying Sherlock's intelligence in a way that is more palatable makes that adaptation of mm. Sherlock much more uh, wide appealing. Mm. In, in that vein, I actually quite like adaptations 
um, where they they subvert the genre of detective fiction. So with detective fiction, you've got this um, you know this sort of Sherlock esque character who is this incredibly smart, um, like hyper like insightful sort of character who is like never misses a beat, always like uh, is, is picking up on all these subtle clues that people people aren't. Um, and usually they are. The, the, in in the, in the original things um, and a lot of adaptations I've seen, the characters are often quite well respected, um, and they're and they're often like you know lauded as um, as a, as a very admirable characters. Mm. Um, what I like is when things get a bit subversive about that because if you've got a character who is like hyper technical and hyper vigilant and is constantly pointing out all these flaws, like you could easily call them out as being socially inept. Yes. Um, where it's like it's it's like yes, you are very good at pointing out all these clues and all that, but sometimes you're just a bit of a dick. Are we allowed to say dick? We are allowed to say that. Hooray. Are we? We're allowed to say dick. I mean, we said Lacroix, holding, so you know. I've been holding back this whole time. But, <laughs> it's um, a brand new show. But it's like, I mean, that's a fairly obvious through line, obviously. But um, but it's it's an example of like subverting that kind of um thing where it's that where, where where like the sort of character who isn't necessarily infallible, but um can be like sort of called out mm. on 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 um being kind of a person that you wouldn't really want to be, um. Which is actually a common trope of the hyper intelligent character nowadays. Uh, I think Rick and Morty kind of popularized that a bit. Mm. Um, though there are obviously many examples before that of like the character who is like you know always knows what they're doing and they're they're, they're usually right, but like that it, it then portrays a character who you want to be because no one particularly likes them. Yeah. <laughs> um, like Bojack Horseman is another good example of that kind of um, character. Right. Uh, and you can do that in detective fiction. Um, is is sort of the the through line on that. But I know it very. I get very round about. I get kind of monologue and just kind of go on about some random tangent. That's right. But that's we'll get we there have, eventually. That's just, why we have you here. Yeah, just put me back on track. If, 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 <laughs> All right, if, if let's, get, let's, let's get back, get on, back track, on track. Then I have uh, something even even you can't get off track about. Mm. That we'll see how we go. Uh, I wanted to ask your upcoming play, The Last Temptation Templeton, is coming out soon. Would you like to tell us a bit about how that started and maybe where we can uh, where we can find you that. So, oh, no. The Last Temptation of Templeton started in a dream. I'm not even joking. Okay, good. So, the way, the way it started... <laughs> Here the, we go. The way it started was, I had a dream where I was pitching this play to, to everyone, um, for, to the, the local drama society. Um, and, and in the dream, they're like, wow, that's the best play I've ever heard. <laughs> and I was like, great. And then I woke up, and I didn't remember anything about it. Self-proclaimed the, friend of the show, yes? I, no, I, so I, it's no, no, just no. Tenacious D's <laughs> tribute in play form. Yeah, all, all I remember about it was that uh, there were three central characters, one of which was named Templeton. Okay. And I was like, all right, I can make a play out of that. Cool. Yeah, and um, um, where, can we, where can we find that? How do we, how do we get on that action? Uh, so you can find um, Tem- Last Intention Templeton uh, uh, at the Factory Theatre website. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's going to Factory Theatre, 17th to 20th of July, and uh, the Red Rattler Theatre, 24th, 25th of July. There's also an event on Facebook, just Last Intention Templeton on Facebook. You'll find the event there. Perfect. Um, that's a very good way to find it. Um, but yeah, it's it's uh, in terms of the actual actual play itself, um, the, the inception of the play is less relevant to the actual, um, like, what well, the play is actually about. And it's not really about much of anything, to be honest. It's, it's an absurdist comedy. It's uh, about three bogans on a porch. And that sounds like a hard sell if ever I've ever I've heard absolutely. one. Um, I mean, yeah. Herds and I have both seen the original short version yes, of the play. Yes. What is it that is going to take that amazing, absurdist mm. dumpster fire in the best possible way <laughs> and turn it into what it is now at its full length? Uh, so I took that dump, that part one, which is mostly just them sitting around <laughs> and talking. Uh, in part two, that, that same kind of through line of wordplay yeah. and, um, and dynamic and just like Bogans being weirdly astute... Um, <laughs> Uh, follows through, but uh, in, in part two, there's a bit more of actually a mystery element to it. Oh, excellent! Um, in, that, in that, um, in that, the main character Templeton goes missing, and then Templeton and his two friends have to go find him. Well, that sounds like a jolly romp. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he goes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, there's, there's a mystery to that as uh, all three of them are trying to work out where he's gone. Excellent. Well, everybody, what well, are the two theaters again so that we can remember? So it's the uh, the Factory Fuse Box Theater, 17th mm-hmm. and 20th of July. Uh, tickets on sale online now. Um, goodbye. Um, <laughs> and the Red Rattler Theater, which is 24th and 25th of July. There you go. You're listening to Death of the Reader, and that was Andrew Fallon, published playwright and the mind behind The Last Temptation of Templeton. Andrew, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure to be on board. If you enjoyed hearing from Andrew, you can catch more about his show on 2SER.com when he sat down to speak to us on 2SER Breakfast. Links on the podcast. You're listening to Death of the Reader on 2SER. I'm Flex. I'm Hertz. And this is your Murder Mystery World Tour. If you want to get in touch with us, check us out at Flex and Herds on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and wherever else it is you waste your time on the internet. Yeah, imagine that we're on a blimp and we're traveling... 
to England and then to England again and then to France and then probably back to England again and then stay in there for a vacation. And that's the tour. I mean, that sounds like a pretty realistic blimp tip trip. Yeah, that sounds pretty okay. Let's just go around Europe. Let's go. That'd be great. <laughs> oh my goodness. So we are discussing chapters eight to 14 of the LaRouge case. The best chapters. I've only read up to chapter 14. It's true. Up to and including. Herds has read the lot. Mm. So he knows what's going on and I have no clue. Or so he thinks. This is true. I know everything. I know the color of the underpants of every single character on the on, in the novel. Is and that the appendices of this them. book? That's exactly correct. I can't wait for you to get them. It's a very shocking twist when that turns out to the appendices. I see. I'm really <laughs> looking forward to when that becomes the absolute clinching, you know, clue of this series. Clinching clue. That's, yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. I well, trust my words carefully. So, Flex, I have to ask. Yes. Who's your culprit? It hasn't changed. Nothing has what changed. What do you mean? Why hasn't it changed? We've literally found all of the evidence we could ever need to convict Albert. I mean, we got the broken foil. We got the, the muddy boots and the torn trousers and the umbrella and the cigar. Like, it's all there. In order to set something like that, you'd have to be some kind of crazy mastermind. You know, I was going to make some quip about how easy it would be for Noel to do all of that, but I would not describe him as a mastermind by any I stretch would of the imagination. Either. He is a good boy. So I guess, really- it, I guess it has to be Albert. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. For, thank you for coming, You're everyone. Welcome. It is Albert. That's what I said. <laughs> this this has been Death of the Reader. There's nothing more to say. Case closed. And I get all I the think, points. Uh, I think that that it definitely is a bit of a trap that we walk into Albert's house and just everything is there. Why would it be there if it's not to convict a criminal? That's what the police's job is: is to find evidence. So here's some hard evidence. You know, like we were doing the floating admiral last week. There wasn't as much hard evidence to go on, but this week. Plenty of it. It's right there. It's right in his library, in fact. Right where all the knowledge is kept. Yeah, I mean, the thing I will say to that is that when all of that evidence gets found, all of his servants turn on him very quickly. Mm. And all of the other servants in this story have been shown to be extraordinarily loyal. So you think that's to do with, you think they're accomplices or something? I, I, I'm i going to I'm gonna put, oh. put, put that on the line. I'm going to say that yeah. they are accomplices. Maybe they're just trying to suck up to their new master. Maybe that's all they care about because all they care about is like staying employed. I mean, that's plausible as well, you but does, does that not also lend itself towards the same theory anyway? I don't think that lends itself to anything. Maybe they're just like, hey, we got a new master. We got to be like, ah, screw that other guy because he's he's not noble anymore. His blood is as mud. Mm. I don't know. Mm. But you bring up an interesting point about nobility there. I do. We were discussing a bit and I was I was still a little confused. I, I do think that it was fairly clear, but I wasn't sure how exactly it was functioning. Mm. But I think I can confidently say that the motive for dear Noel, who is mm. still my, my culprit, is that he was trying to marry Juliet <gasps> and was forbidden because of the lacking nobility of his birth. Oh, that's so good. So that's why. I'm still not entirely sure which side of the family that's come from because obviously Juliet's family, it basically doesn't factor into the story as she's said I mean, to have come family, up a pauper. Yeah, she she was a, well, not an urchin, I suppose. She apparently did not have a father and her mother beat her and all this sort of stuff, which is awful. Uh, she was brought up on, on sweet meats and damaged fruits, which I assume means that she was poor and not fed well as a child. Um, but yeah, she uses her looks to like get, get what she wants, girl. Um... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Can apparently. We get that as a soundbite. Please do. Put that in the intro. Put that in some kind of meme. Um, yeah, she's got to. She got to get what she wants. She's a gold digger. Uh, apparently. Um, I don't know. It, it's pretty clear that that Noel is head over heels for her. He'll do whatever, whatever, whatever he wants, whatever she wants, whatever he can for her. But you think that includes murder? I don't think. I'm not. I'm not saying that mm. she's asked him to kill anyone. I'm oh. just saying that that's why he's killed someone. Oh, you think she's she wanted a little bit of a little spice in her life, some murder? No, I, that's explicitly the opposite of what I'm saying. Okay, <laughs> just making sure we're on the same page here. Yeah, I I don't know. It's like as I said last week, I think that this story definitely does in the middle section try and sway you as far away from Noel as possible after making him fairly suspicious in the first part. He's just a good boy. He just wants to, he wants to help Albert out of prison. He wants to marry the girl of his dreams. What's more romantic than that? And really we should be on the side of the romance here. Okay. That's the should real. Should we? Yeah. I, mean, I don't think that it is a far cry to say that Juliet was named after one Shakespeare character you may have heard of. And thus, you know, the forbidden romance and the the double suicide is probably coming at the end. I'm, uh, I'm going to put that on the table. I don't think so. I, think, I, I don't think there'll be any suicide going All on right. Here. And I also think that 
if the culprit was Albert, arresting him right at the start of the story it seems like a strange move. And I don't want to say that it couldn't work mm. because I think especially given how early this was, arguably the first in the genre, mm. like that isn't a problem because we don't have the tropes and standards to set that out. I mean, it's pretty clear to me that Albert has uh, gone on the murder rampage because somebody told him to. Really? Who was that? Yeah, well, well, he also has a, a sweetheart that he's going oh, after. Yeah. So it's possible. His lovely sweetheart, Claire, who apparently M. Dabaron is also interested in. I don't know, maybe there's something going on there. Why or maybe is it that just every character has a relationship in this book? That's the fun part. That's why I love this like, novel so much. Dabaron, I'll be real. Dabaron's like the police officer, right? Like, he's the what's, magistrate. What's he doing tied up with the, the suspects? Well, he's tied up. Well, yeah, you're right. Actually, he does try to kill Albert, which is fun. Um, he goes to like a, a party <laughs> Such a or something. Stand up guy. It's fantastic. That's what I love about this novel. I'm gonna keep coming back to is the fact that they feel like real characters and they have relationships and they act on their motives, but they don't actually kill each other because that'd be mean. Um, but yeah, and the Baron was in love with Claire, and then she found out that Claire thought of him as a as a father figure, and she actually loved Albert. And she hasn't even been on screen yet, I don't think. Oh, she, except for that flashback. So that's fun. But yeah, I think that Albert, he's, he's doing out of love. That's where love comes from. That's what it all comes down to. This novel is all about romance and love and what it'll make you do. I see. I'm saying that Albert did the killing, but right. that perhaps Claire persuaded him to. Or that the Count did. Or maybe the Count hired an assassin. There's all sorts of places we can take this. There are all sorts of places we could take this, but none of what you've said is to the answer. <gasps> that's inappropriate. Listen, I'm still sticking with Noel and Juliet mm. and, you know, the the servants being tied in and roped, mm. roped into this scheme. It Listen, just seems funny that the Count wouldn't know what his, his servants are doing. It seems funny that the Count wouldn't know what his servants are doing? Well, what the Viscount's servants are doing. Yeah. Really? Yeah, I think that's very funny. Even though we've just been discussing how easily they switch person to person. No, but that's with uh, Albert being switched. The vi the Count, however, is a vampire, as we know. And if you betray a vampire, you get your blood sucked out of you. I see, I see. All right. I'm just saying. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Yeah, there you go. I'm glad that you've man. posited this solution, even though that's meant to be my role here. I'm just saying, I got to posit my own solutions here. Otherwise, what's the point of me being here? What am I here for? <laughs> I would have been really concerned, honestly. I would have been terrified if you'd come into this room and just said, yeah, it's null. I would have loved to have done that, but I can't agree with such heresy, as, as one might put it. I just wanted to give a shout out to one of our listeners who reached out to us on uh, on Twitter, uh, who made the point that our dear favorite boy, Ronald Knox, at one point said something along the lines of that if in a murder mystery you just boldly state the answer, people will think you're pulling their leg. It's true. It's and true. I... I still think that we have so many instances of this going on all throughout the story. Mm. But I think all of them still lead to Null because all of the assertions that lead to Albert seem to be indirect assertions, like the fact that it was a broken foil that was the weapon and Albert's the one we happen to find with the a broken foil. The fact that foil. there are five, piece, five pieces of evidence in his, like, house? That's not an assertion, though. That's an assertion that... That's hard that evidence. evidence. No, 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 but that's evidence that exists. Uh -huh. Whereas the assertions made about Noel seem to be more like character assertions, which is why I'm I'm a little more suspicious of him. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. That's your call, man. I'm just saying we had a lack of hard evidence in the last novel, and there's plenty of it, and you're like, no, no, no point in having that hard well, evidence there. Who needs it? We we haven't really dealt with many frame jobs on this show, but That's I true. reckon that we this could be a thorough framing. Oh, you think he's got some kind of plan this Noel. Inside men. His lovely man. servants. Who's just worried about his poor not mother who's dying of shock, apparently. Is that what it is? You really think that Noel cares for his not mother? Maybe he after does. After spending multiple chapters he's an emotional, complaining that he's been lying he's to an, her? He's an emotional child, all right? And he just wants his mother, not mother, to be happy, even if he doesn't admit it himself. This makes very little sense. It makes perfect sense. I see. You understand? <laughs> It's about love. Don't you get it? And the familial bond. That's what it's all about. Mm. Count's got to realize that he's got to let his son be who his son is, which is not his son. And he's got to let, you got you to let uh, MJ, he's got to let her son, you know, not be a murderer and be okay with, with all of these people being murdered and just live her own life. I just want to posit something to you that occurred to me uh, not oh, long no. before we came on air tonight. Oh no, I'm concerned. Is that what if herds? Uh oh. Tabaret is the culprit. It's rubbish. It's rubbish. Is it? 
Yeah, it's rubbish. Is it rubbish? It's a detective. Well, you're right, but at this point in history, we didn't have the aforementioned standards for the genre. I know we that don't. would have made that a a Falk's pass. A Falk's pass. I understand. I understand. I mean, hey, I'll be honest. I actually, before I realized that Tabaret was a detective, I thought he might be because he talks a lot about his, about his father, his relationship to his father, mm-hmm. um, which is a fun little fun little anecdote back in chapter two, I believe, or maybe the end of chapter one. I think it's two. Um, talks about how his relationship was not good. His father was gouging him for money, so maybe there is a theory there. But uh, I mean, to my mind, there's actually a, a fair bit of evidence going for it, as well as some contextual clues, because mm-hmm. we know that Tabaret is not the main detective in Gaboriero's following it's novels. True. That it's is true. Lecoq, who appears and introduces Tabaret. Mm. And I think that considering that Lecoq was associated with the police, but we we know that later on down the line that this police versus amateur detective thing continued in Gaboriero's works, mm. maybe Lecoq was evicted from the force because Tabaret was actually the criminal and he vouched for him. And that's why he ends up as an amateur detective. That'd be a pretty good twist. And then we also have the fact that all of these assertions seem to come true, almost as though Tabaret knew them all. He's planned it. He's playing the long gun. Get him. I, I Get ge- that detective. I genuinely would not be surprised. It'd be pretty amazing. Like, I don't think that's the answer, and I'm going to stick with Noel. But as, as we were, like, literally walking into the studio, I was just like, oh, my God, what if it's that? Mm. Um. There's another author that we'll cover a bit down the line who spoke a bit more about the detective, at, you know, and the role of the culprit. And, you know, that's obviously one of Knox's rules as well. Mm. But I think that because this is an earlier novel, listen, if if it does end up being Tabaret, give me half points. I'll give you half. I'll give, okay. you, I'll give, you, I'll give you half of half of one, okay, which thank is you. also half. Thank you. I, I will say all of your theories seem to rely on a very overly complicated plan. Do you think that's the sort of thing to expect in this novel? Yes, is is the is the short answer I will give. Fair enough. Because this was a serialized publication, what that means is that the audience would have had a bit more time to get used to everything that was happening rather than reading it all at once. Right. And so perhaps there's a bit more room to say that a complicated solution can work. And not to mention that framing someone is not a complex concept, even if the methods mm. are complicated. And that was part two of the LaRouge case, chapters 8 to 14. Herds, I don't think you could have swayed me any more than you already did, which is to say not at all. (laughs) It was a valiant effort. (laughs) It was a valiant effort, but it's all right. There is still one final chance for you to be right, and that is part three, chapters 15 to 20 of the LaRouge case. The culprit is revealed, and sorry, Herds, you weren't right at all. What? I thought it was the vampire of the old lady. No, no. It was, in fact, Noel all along. What? How, who could have seen that one coming? Me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be talking about all of the strange coincidences that led to solving this crime. We're going to be talking about the romantic core of the story. Yeah, we're going to be talking to Shu Ming Tio, uh, romance expert. So we talk about romance and what it means to the uh, modern uh, crime fiction writer and reader. I found it particularly interesting sitting down and hearing about how it's evolved over the years, the idea mm. that romance is a very different game to what it was back in the time of the LaRouge case. Yeah, this extended cut here will be taking a little bit of a, a closer look at the, uh, the the 20th century of writing and uh, and how things have evolved over time. It's going to be very a very fun time, I think. Yes, and then finally, Herds, was this story fair? Find out now in the extended cut. <laughs> You're listening to Death of the Reader on 2SER. We are Flex and Herds, and it's time to farewell the Widow LaRouge, as we have reached, in fact, the end of her case. Over the past three weeks, we've been speaking about all of the dastardly schemes and conniving servants that led to her demise and the framing of the Viscount, Albert de Comerin. But Herds... Flex? It was all just a big coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> um, also, the title is a lie. The Widow LaRouge is not a widow. Um, none of the clues matter for anything. Um, <laughs> this is the fun part about this novel and actually why I enjoyed reading it so much, especially last week getting to chat to you and being like, why do you think that the broken foil has been missing and that they found the kid gloves and there's the money boots and the... It, it doesn't matter. The answer doesn't matter. It just happened to all be occurring at the same time. Albert was like... Yo, I'm going to go and see my sweetheart. And I was like, I'm going to kill a widow who isn't actually a widow. And then he left his stuff on the train. I know. 
<laughs> like, the thing is, is on the one hand, I feel like I should be furious about the fact that none of the clues mattered at all. Are you furious, though? Because, this is because, like, there wasn't really any foreshadowing, I thought, as to the fact that everything was just, it just happened, right? No, there wasn't. However, <laughs> I went back and I've read the first the first few chapters over oh, again, which oh. we'll talk about later in the show. But it occurred to me, Ben, mm. that everything Tabaree said was a coincidence. True. Sure. Yeah. I mean, he literally would talk about, this is the son who has been switched with the other son, but they hadn't actually. That's what we find out later, of course. And he's just living right near now. No, like the whole book is a big bag of coincidences it is. right from the beginning. And, and yeah, and I, I I, was mad about it. I was like genuinely frustrated <laughs> with like, I put in all of this goddamn effort and you're telling me he just left it on the train? Yeah. But- he just left ev- all of the evidence on the train and then they found it. And uh, like, he, he had a little name tag saying, I am the murderer and he left it on the train. But then it turned out that Albert also had a name tag that said, I am the murderer. But it was like misspelled a little bit. And so they were like, yo, Mara, we, we got you. Nailed it. Going to jail. Getting hanged. But yeah, after the, after that reread, I was like, oh, it just, it was all coincidences. And he was just oh. open about that the whole time. Also the power of love. Ugh, just. <laughs> Which I love. No. Look. No. Yes, it is. It is the power of love. I love this novel so much. I had the biggest, dumbest grin on my face. I was like, is this all just going to not matter? And it's going to be that the, the pure and innocent woman character who can't do anything on her own but loves a man so much she's gonna come and save him this is great i loved it i'm not sure whether the like <laughs> way that this story presents love <laughs> is self-aware <It's> <laughs> because everyone is just absolutely delusional mm. you know we have this entire scene where Every time the, you know, the love interest is introduced with, with Dabaron, with Noel, with Albert, just all of, all of their romances mm. are all horrible to them. Yeah. They're well blindly devoting themselves. Yeah. I mean, that's the idea of like romance, right? This is, this is a part where you know, like, this was written in the, the 19th century. The, the idea of romance that you devote yourself 100% to someone like Albert Lies about having an al- not having an alibi because he doesn't want to hurt the you know to hurt the person he loved or betray her trust, which it like is what allows him to escape in the end because she comes to to the magistrate of her own accord and says, "Oh, I am here in my white dress and my ghostly pale figure. Let me tell you all of the truths." Oh, you see, magistrate, and that's that's the scene. I hope you enjoyed that voice, by the way. Oh my um, goodness, it was. <laughs> But, like, the thing is, is I'm not sure whether, like, these relationships were as ridiculous as they read. Like, was was this meant to be, like, a serious, like, oh, look at how, look at how hard these men are pushing for this romance. Like, was this actually what Gaboriel thought was a compelling romance? Or was he aware of how, like absolutely stupid these characters were because I'm I'm on the fence about it. I definitely think there is an element of, of tongue-in-cheekness. Like, we can see that he's poking fun at the aristocracy all the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's definitely, like, that's not in question. Um, I, I think that the uh, the obvious, you know, parallel to that or the, the contrast to that in the, you know, all of these characters are in it for money and then these characters are in it for love, which is pure and wholesome. I mean, I'm not sure if he's making fun of that or if it's just kind of part of the, uh, how would I describe it? Not satirical, but just the strange plot that they get caught up in, I suppose. Well, I think if it was like one or two of the characters that had this style of relationship and then there Mm. was another example of like a better relationship so we could kind of laugh at the difference between them, Mm. then I'd feel it was more tongue in cheek. Yeah. Because it's all of them. It it. feels like, is this, is it taking itself seriously? Which is a bit weird. Well, especially um, we have the reveal from from Juliet, which is something it's, it's kind of subtly, subtly, subtly is in air quotes, but um, <laughs> there is very Juliet, little subtlety. You know, is saying, "Oh, how you how you bore me, Noel! You just you just give me money and you never let me see your friends." And then in the end, when he comes to her and it's like, "Yo, we got to run! I am wanted by the police. I am being hunted like an animal," which is great, by the way. Mm. That chapter where it describes Noel and his like his mindset as he's like stumbling through the streets and people are looking at him, he's getting paranoid. That is a fantastic chapter. Yeah. It is completely different from everything else in the book. It feels like you're in the mind of a, of a killer who's been, who knows they're caught, you know? And mm. I love that. It's so good. 
um, really ties into what I've been saying about how this novel, its biggest strength is not the mystery. It's like how um, we, we feel like these are like real people to an, to an extent, at least. There is that yeah. cheat nature to it. Um, but yeah, uh, Juliet says, but I've loved you this whole time. And she, she goes, let's run away together. But they spend about 10 minutes trying to pick up all her jewelry. Um, and that's when the police rock up. <laughs> so really, he doomed himself through love, mm. which is great. Well, I think uh, the thing that you've reminded me of there is, oh, yeah. once again, Knox's first rule, that yes. the culprit must be mentioned in the early part of the story. But we don't often address the following part of that rule, yeah. which is, but they must not be anyone whose thoughts the reader has been allowed to follow. Yeah. Right? Mm. Now, one thing I noticed early in the story is that when we go to meet Juliet for the first time, we explicitly never get Noel's thoughts yeah. in that scene, um, mm -hmm. which I was one of the reasons I was suspicious of him because I was like, okay, we're obviously keeping a more third-person perspective than we yes, were for Tabaret yes. or anyone else. Um, but I really liked that once the story was confident and open with the fact that yeah. it's Noel, then we it's like in. he's yeah. in his head. It's beautiful. I... I wish that more murder mysteries would do this. I think um, most most ones that I've read, you know, you find out who the culprit is or the ones I'm aware of, you find out who the culprit is and it's like, oh, I've got you. And then there might be a chase scene, but that's that's it. We've got him and then we end and we, we follow our heroes for the rest of it. But we spent a, a good long while with Noel, like following his thought process, seeing how he he could run away. He even has like a, a fat sack of cash. Mm. Um from his, from his father, no less. Is this whole and that is a whole like crazy, you know, journey finding out that he is his father, but not actually like he's not actually a legitimate son. And and then the the widow's husband shows up to tell us everything. Anyway, yeah, I but, mean, but yeah, th that entire thing was like it was obviously meant to be confusing because it was meant to be yes. kind of one of the core puzzles of was, the story. It was very silly, but just trying to follow who was related to who and who knew yeah. who and just all of that was. Perhaps the most difficulty I've ever had in a single murder mystery doing so. Yeah. To and the point where over the past two episodes, I've constantly mm -hmm. accidentally called the Count, the Viscount, <laughs> because I just, I was so, so stuck on yeah. who was who that I did, it didn't even occur to me that they, they were two different characters because yeah. I kept referring to Albert as Albert instead of as the Viscount. I, uh, I definitely think it's one of those challenges of going through uh, a, a translated book, a book from, from, Long time ago, we don't have these same kind of, I don't know if stands is the right word, but we, these same conventions, like, as you say, when we're jumping back and forth between first person and third person narratives, we have these coincidences, we have, uh, you know, we're introduced to all of these suspects, even back in the first chapter that we don't see until the very end as well. Mm. Like the man with the earrings and the man with the with the, with the, the sunburn, it does not even show up. He's, he's introduced as a lead, like, witness or, you know, accomplice maybe to the crime, and we don't. You know, I expected, oh, we're going to get a couple of scenes where we go to see each of these characters and find out what they're about. But then we go off with Noel, who was not even mentioned in the first chapter as being anything to do with the crime. It's it's crazy um, the way this novel jumps around. But I think it's fun, yeah. um, which is like one of those weird things. It, it speaks to the the kind of quaintness of the novel. You can tell that it's not as refined. It's, it doesn't, you know, follow as many conventions as a, as a modern, you know, crime novel. But it has an undeniable sense of fun as we follow these characters. <laughs> yeah. I think the other thing with all of those characters that we kind of had thrown to, but never actually showed up is that maybe they were originally meant to show up, maybe. but because it was a serialized story and you know, this was the kind of era where it would have been much easier for a Parisian to write a letter to Gaborio and say like, Oh, I love this part of your novel. Mm. You know, maybe he got a bunch of letters that were like, Noel's an excellent character. And he's like, all right, he's the bad guy. Yeah, maybe. Um, or, you know, maybe a bunch of his letters didn't actually address the guy with the earring at all. So he kind of put him to yeah. the wayside because it's a serialized release. There can be a lot more dynamic push and pull from the audience. I think, uh, of how that story develops over time and a lot more of uh, a, a dynamic way that the author can explore where their head's at. As we were talking with Sean Britton in the final part of The Floating Admiral, one of the things that's difficult between sequels and all sorts of things is that you as an author have changed and how does that change the way you write? I think the other thing about it being a serialized release as we've spoken about over the past few weeks is mm. that, you know, maybe he was trying to keep it a lot more unpredictable by intentionally yep. being vague and breaking rules and mm. 
foreshadowing things that weren't actually relevant. Like, I don't want to say that that lends itself to a good story because <laughs> I, I do think it feels like a bit of a waste of time. But in the context of someone who would have been following that week to week, mm. I don't think it would have been as painful if you were along for the ride when it was coming out. Yeah, well, at least for a lot of exciting moments, as I say, the, the chase scene of, of, you know, catching the criminal is often kind of superfluous and kind of tapped on the end. And like in a movie, especially it's, you know, it's all about the spectacle. Let's see how many snipers Sherlock can dodge as he, as he heads after Moriarty, whatever. He's going to catch him or he's in who I don't who remember. I don't remember that part of the book. I'm pretty sure that was in the second Robert Downey Jr. movie. I there see. was a scene, there was a scene like that. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I, I know that one. <laughs> <laughs> the book's less so, but um, one of my favorite scenes, which was like pretty darn superfluous, was when Tabaret is chasing after Juliet in in the the cab or whatever, and he's like, "Follow that blue bonnet." And the driver in his head is like, "Ah, oh, I see. He's he's found out his woman is with another man." <laughs> and then he chases her for twenty <laughs> francs, and then he's he's like, "Oh, she's getting away." And he and in the, the his mind, the cab driver is saying, "Oh, well, I'm I'm on the side of the woman usually in these cases, but for forty francs." I'll chase it down for you. And it's this very silly, like, I don't even remember. I don't think he got a name, the cab driver, but yeah. he was one of the funniest characters just with only three lines all in his head. It was beautiful. Um, but as you say, there are some weaknesses. And I think that the the biggest weakness that I kind of found was in the ending mm. where they have the like, oh, the murderers killed themselves, but they're just how they have just enough strength to write a confession. So everything can be put to right. And the, the the couple, the like romantic interests can get together and that's that's it. And it just kind of trails off with like Tabaret. I, I think there's a nice little nod to Tabaret saying that he then, you know, was more interested in cases where um, guilt was not 100% prescribed, which mm. is which is nice. But it definitely feels more like it's like we got to the second last chapter of the book. We had our climax and then we jump straight to like the post credit scene. Like there should be a, a scene between those two things. Mm. saying This is how we wrap up all the... I don't know. I, I feel like it just wrapped up like very quickly and strangely. I don't know if you felt the same or not. I, I, I do agree with that. I think that we've been complimenting the book over the previous two weeks about how consistent it was in tone. As we should. And I think that was true right up until that part where you mentioned where suddenly yeah. it's like, hold on, what's just happened? Where have we jumped? Yeah. But, and I'll speak about this a bit in the third part. I don't think that it's entirely unjustified. You know, it, it can feel a little bit weird, but it's one of those things where in the detective story, realistically what happens is that you know the culprit gets caught life goes on yeah and how do you wrap that up tidily there's not as much of an event after the culprit's been caught see you in the next the next one right that's usually how those end yeah like if they'd put like a throw to a following novel or something that's kind of mm. one of the standard ways to do something there sure, but yeah. you know i it, it didn't bother me even if it did stand out yeah, for sure. But right now, Herds, it's time to jump over to Shuming Teo, professor from Macquarie University and an expert on romantics who can hopefully set us straight about what's going on with all these damn love stories. This is Death of the Reader. You're listening to Death of the Reader on 2SCR. This is Flex and Hertz with more guest talent here to sweep you off your feet and teach you about your months. We have Associate Professor Xu Ming Tio, author of Desert Passions, Orientalism, and Romance Novels, Behind the Moon, and Love and Vertigo, the latter of which earned the Vogel Award in 1999. Xu Ming, welcome to the show. Thanks, Ben. It's a pleasure to have you here. How are you doing today? I'm pretty good. That's good. That's good. Yeah, we'll just jump right on into it. We're here to discuss the Larouche case, which, as I enjoy, has a strong romantic focus. The killer has a strong drive to pursue the woman he loves by any means. Xu Ming, how does the romantic genre blend itself with the genre of detective fiction? There are a lot of crossovers. We probably trace the modern detective mm. um, novel with romantic elements back to the 1920s and 1930s with mm. Georgia Heyer's novels. Right, so Georgia Hire wrote Regency romances, but she also wrote um, detective fiction during de the golden age of detective fiction. So she was among, I guess, um, the re the writers that your uh, the, your listeners are probably familiar with: Agatha Christie, Marjorie mm. Ollingham, Patricia Wentworth, Niall Marsh, Dorothy Sayers. So she was among those, but um, her detective fiction tended to have romantic subplots as well. Mm. So that's probably the, um, the English provenance of it. In terms of the French, um, your case is very interesting. Do you want to tell us more about it? Yeah, I think one of the most exciting things about the LaRouge case is that it's set in, you know, revolutionary periods of France. Uh, it's a very 
you know, the layman versus the police. But the really interesting thing is that every character in the story has this romantic connection and there's lots of intertwining, almost to the point where he gets a bit soap (laughs) opera-like. But the thing that's really fascinating about it is how normally you'd have one or two characters driving the romance in a story, Mm -hmm. whereas it's every character in the LaRouge case, and I think that's one of the special and interesting ways that it presents romance. Right, okay. Mm. Um, So this really fits fits in, I think, with 19th century fiction generally. This The 19th century was the great age of romance. It's when um, the romantic novel first begins uh, right across Europe. But um, I think romance back then did not mean the happy ever after that it does today. So um, I guess we call it love stories nowadays, but... um, the 19th century was a great believer in love stories. Uh, so I think this whole notion that you've got to pair up, um, you know, your couple in order to have some kind of resolution, mm. um, that's probably very 19th century. Well, LaRouge case is a, a special instance where we have uh, the villain's romance ends in tragedy, whereas the hero's ends in, in triumph. And it's because of this romance uh, that the, the hero of the, of the story is able to... Uh, to, to come to to a victory, which I think is particularly interesting. Um, so I guess I would ask, how, how has romance changed over time following a, a shift in cultural sensibilities? There have been massive changes, but uh, most notably in heroes and heroines. Yeah. Right. So I think in the 19th century, um, the, the hero is very distinct from the villain or mm. tends to be in 19th century um, romantic fiction. The hero is the repository of all good, noble, you know, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. virtuous behavior. And the villain, of course, is, um, is the archetypal villain who uh, was one of um, his main traits of villainy is that he threatens the heroine's chastity. Mm. Um, I think all of this changes by the early 20th century, particularly with the publication of E.M. Hull's um, novel, The Sheik, mm. because what Hull did was to combine the villain and the hero. So you have the villainous hero who is both a threat and a menace and a danger to the heroine, mm. makes it much, much more exciting for her, um, but you know he's redeemed by the heroine at the end. Um, so there's a there's this big shift in the early 20th century but by the mid century you've got all of these quite nasty villainous heroes who are very disagreeable um, um, you know that I would say today we would say that they are sexual harassers right <laughs> uh, they're not particularly nice there the, you know, because uh, part of, part of it was about how passion, romance, high emotions, intense emotions could be signified through writing. And it took a while for people to work out how to do that, how to represent passion. Um, In the mid-20th century, they tended to represent passion um, through conflict, the battle of the sexes. Now, in the 19th century, when the the hero was much more distinct um, from the villain and it was hero and heroine, um, it was also a much more religious time. So there was a lot more recourse to spiritual, you know, um, I guess praying to God and all kinds of stuff and very, very lofty spiritualized language to to indicate uh, intensity of emotion. And that goes in the early 20th century as the the romance becomes secularized. Then we've got the conflict of the sex the battle of the sexes where hero and heroine just don't seem to get along. They spend the whole um, the whole story fighting and you wonder why they end up with each other at the end. right? Mm. Now that changes towards the end of the 20th century um, and a lot of that has to do with the Americanization of the romance novel as well when you start to get more normal, more realistic types of um, heroes and heroines um, uh, being represented. I think the other thing that was interesting particularly about the LaRouge case as you were talking about how it's, you know, love was more of a tragedy and less passion-based back in the 19th century. A lot of the relationships and romances we have going on in the LaRouge case end up being fruitless or seemingly critiquing the way people treat each other. For example, uh, one of the main characters in the novel, Noel, his romance is very much one-sided where he's just giving this woman everything that he has and getting nothing in return. How is that reflected in the romantic genre at the time and how much is that reflected in other works? Okay. Um, that, that's coming straight out of romanticism, like Goethe's Werther, the, um, the Sorrows of the Young, young Werther. Um, the 19th century was an age where people really believed in unrequited love. 
right? And this is the purest form of love. And the purest um, ending to a love um, story is a tragedy because that makes your emotions that much sharper than if they were all to end happily ever after. So the fact that um, you have unrequited love, I think, um, is quite common in 19th century um, love stories. And when you think about society back then, it's probably not uncommon as well because people don't move around as much. So, you know, um, the communities in which they live, um, they move, they court um, and marry, it's a lot smaller than today. And today, of course, it's completely different because, you know, um, uh, you get over the person that you were in love with and you look for the next person. The 19th century wouldn't have liked that because love is, is not supposed to commoditize the, um, the beloved, right? That they become interchangeable with the next one that comes along, you know. So you're sort of looking at, well, I've fallen in love with this person. If they don't return my feelings, um, that's really sad and I grieve a bit, but then I move on to the next one because there is the next one. Um, so that's how we think of, to, uh, of it today and it's probably helpful. Healthier. But back then, um, it, uh, the person that you fell in love with was supposed to be the ideal. It was the one and only. And um, if they didn't re um, return your love, then you just live this blighted life. But if you fell in love with someone else and moved on, then um, they would have questioned, was that really love to begin with? Yeah, it sounds to me almost like that is a result of the commonality of arranged marriages back in those days. Do you think that that is true? And how does that manifest itself? By the 19th century, uh, arranged marriages were not that common. So uh, people were starting to marry for love, particularly among the middle classes, which is, of course, the readership for your novel. Uh, people ha had a lot more choice. But I think one of the reasons why um, we see love and courtship featuring so heavily in the 19th century novel um, in, in all kinds of genres is because people were trying to work out, well, what does it mean to fall in love, to be in love and to marry for love? Um Marriage for love, you know, the, what they call the love match, places a lot of responsibility on individuals. If, if your parents arrange your marriage, um, if you are not happy, well, that's on them. It's not your fault. But if you're responsible for falling in love and for making a choice of a partner based on your feelings of love, then you probably want to know um, what does being in love actually mean. And so there is a lot of literature, a lot of um, writing about what does it mean to be in love in the 19th century, not just in fiction, but also in advice manuals, um, in you know literary periods articles as well, even in newspapers. Um, we still have talk about love, but it's more about managing. It's, it's within the self-help genre. But in the 19th century, it, was, it really was exploratory because the stakes were so high, yeah, especially for women. Mm. We've spoken a fair bit with this book about how it critiques the aristocracy and the upper class of the mm -hmm. time. And I think that that change where the middle class was starting to marry more for love, whereas the upper class was maybe lagging a bit behind there and the arranged marriage of the more noble people in the book definitely reflects that. Mm -hmm. What sort of lessons do you think that modern romance writers could take from these historical depictions of romance? That's quite a hard one to answer, I think. For one thing, the fundamental protagonist of the romance has moved on. Mm. In the 19th century, you've got all of these heroines who are passive. Things happen to them. You know, they undergo adventures. A lot of their journeys are emotional. It's internal. But they don't go out there and do things because they've got really limited options. Mm. Nowadays, um, it's completely different. Um, nowadays, um, like with modern romance, you've got women, you know, heroines um, uh, or heroes or, you know, whichever protagonist in LGBTQ um, plus uh, romances. But the, pro the romantic protagonist is already whole in themselves. They're not looking for somebody to complete them. Uh, mm. The romance, the love, that's just an addition, you know, to a life already well lived. So mm. I think that's it, it's really different to think about what they could go back and take from the past. It's really, you know, asking them to take from a context that's really quite different. Of course, yeah. We've talked a lot about the history. Um, obviously, you've written quite a few, few texts on romance. Why are you so interested in the topic of romance? What sparked that uh, creative? Oh, well, okay. So my first this novel, Love and Vertigo, is really about, um, it's, it's really the anti-romance of the family. So it's about um, the falling apart of the family. But one of the reasons why, um, I guess, the family falls apart is how the family got together in the first place. So um, so the, uh, the narrator's mother um, was of that first generation from Singapore society who got educated and then who married for love or what she thought was love. But um, it's even, it's clear in that novel that what she imagines to be love is what she has learned learned 
um, from reading love poetry, British love poetry particularly, and the movies as well. So it's this whole mm. discourse of love, right? So I think I'm really interested in um, how love is represented, how it's changed over time, because it's something that people think it's natural. Um, everybody thinks that they know something about love. Mm. Right, that they're an expert of um, uh, in matters of love um, because of their own experiences, and yet when we look at the history of love um, and what it means and the ideas that are attached to it, this changes over time. Right, so if the ideas change, the emotions change as well. So, for example. Um, Today, we are quite reluctant to think about a lot of pain as being a part, a, you know, a normal part of love. In the 19th century, you couldn't have love without having pain because the, the suffering process was supposed to, you know, accentuate the experience of love, right? So that's one thing that is really quite different. Mm. Um, the way people express love also dif um, differs significantly. So there's an, um, one of my favourite um, anecdotes is an early modern um, a scholar who, uh, who looks at Welsh um, traditions of love, and he says that well, you know, in this village in Wales and in, um, in the uh, in the Middle Ages, how young men would express their love or attraction for a young woman it would be to pee on her dress, right. Uh, it's a practice that they, it's called Rithu, R H Y T H Y uh, T H U. Now today we think that you know that it was assault, that it <laughs> expresses contempt, right? It's completely Not very classy, the no. It's completely the opposite. Yeah. You know, but it just shows that love has a cultural history, and how it's expressed is actually very much determined by culture. Yeah. yeah. So that's why I'm really interested, I guess, in this no. in the topic. That's an excellent answer. Yeah. Makes me wonder what sort of strange new things we'll be doing in the near future <laughs> to express our love to each other. Hopefully not taking lessons from the Welsh. No, not mm. in that regard anyway. Maybe from, from your novel. Maybe, right? maybe. Mm -hmm. We'll throw all our money at someone and then get shot at the end. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> that won't be pleasant. Yeah, I've heard you describe crime and romance fiction today as a flourishing subgenre. What makes you say that? Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Okay, so as I said, um, crime and romance as genres uh, or subgenres start to intermingle um, yes. from the 1930s onwards in the novels of George at Hire. Um, and they, you know, there's a sort of lag in the 20th century, the mid 20th century, when it's really about the gothic and the romance. But when the romance genre takes off, in, um, especially in the 1980s, so this is when the genre becomes Americanized, there's a whole lot of American writers, they're bestsellers, um, and they're writing romance. And then the romance ceases to be sufficiently interesting for what they want to do. And so they start um, including elements of crime in because um, I said before that in the mid 20th century, how people um, depict passion, romance, love is through the battle of the sexes. But how do you get, you know, um, if, if you don't want your hero and heroine to be fighting all the time, how do you get them to work together? And one of the ways that romance writers did, um, uh, you know, was to was to combine romance with crime, because then you've got um, the detective or whoever it is, you know, the good guy working with the heroine to solve some kind of crime. Right. And they're both working on the same side. And that becomes really, really popular. So you've got um, uh, novelists who are still writing today. Um, they're making mega bucks. People like Sandra Brown, um, Karen Roberts. Um, even the romance novelist, probably the most famous um, American romance novelist, is a woman called Nora Roberts. And she uh, has written uh, in the 90s. Um, She'd written hundreds of romances already, and she um, turned towards crime. And she writes. She began writing crime novels under the pseudonym J.D. Robb. Um, it's this in death series. There's about forty five, but just under fifty um, of, of them now. Too many. <laughs> um, a lot. Stephen King is a big, big fan, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, you know, but she but she does really interesting things with it because. Um, setting romance within a crime series allows her to res to explore marriage, which was something that the romance novel didn't really allow um, novelists to do, because the romance novel works well in terms of um, of telling a story about courtship, and then it ends when they get together, whether it's marriage or whatever. But you just assume that they live happily together, you know, in whatever state. But um, but they didn't really explore marriage, and once when they you know when novelists or writers starting start exploring marriage, then you get the soap. Opera. Opera. Because how do you keep um, the reader's interest going? You know, um, you entangle, disentangle the relationship. You add in obstacles, and then they part. So the romance sort of leads into um, into um, 
the soap opera quite well um, and quite often it ends up with the couple splitting right because mm. that elicits um, readers or, or viewers interest but um, setting a romance within the crime genre allowed JD Robb Nora Roberts to explore um, the, the patterns the ups and downs of a marriage while still keeping it as a romance because in the end they would get together um, the, the police detective um, Eve Dallas would get together um, with her billionaire husband to solve crime mm. right so uh, so there are you know there are practical reasons I guess plot wise why this actually works it's solving the mystery not just of the case but also of each other's hearts <laughs> I one might say so. I that's yeah. very romantic thank you <laughs> <laughs> anyway well that's a lot of recommendations in there for things you can check out and thank you so much for coming on the show you're very welcome and thanks for having me this has been Death of the Reader we are talking the LaRouge case and we'll be back in just a second if you wanted to check out more of Shuming Teo's work, you can find a link on the podcast to her latest publications. You're on 2SER. This is Death of the Reader. We are Flex and Herds, bringing you a murder mystery world tour. And this week is the final episode for the LaRouge case. And the end for Noel, the lovely good boy who nobody hated and that was definitely innocent of all crimes. Right, right, Flex. <laughs> Absolutely. It was that awful old woman who died halfway through the novel. Uh, so <laughs> this is the part of this this is the part of the show where we talk about what we thought of the puzzle, how fair it was, uh, how absolutely goddamn right I was, ish. Whatever. <laughs> it's just gonna happen every second week. So don't just get used to it, guys. Just buckle in and get ready for the ride of him. Yeah. Just tell me how how smart he is. I'll just put on my smug glasses smarty and smarty we'll carry on. Yeah, it's awful. I don't think I can take as much credit for being right about this novel as we could have for the previous novels we've covered, because nice. as we said it earlier in the episode, it's just an absolute pile of coincidences and practically tells you what's going on. It's great. I love it. This is my favorite murder mystery where like the mystery drives, it drives the plot. It brings us to this moral of like love, love conquers all, but also can bring you to your downfall. That's, that's a cool thing to explore. But the mystery isn't like the entire point of the novel, which I know is heresy to say on a murder mystery show, but like, that's just, that's just how I be. I love murder mystery. I love puzzling stuff out. But if that is the entire point, I don't feel like, I don't know. I, I want, I want that emotional connection. I want that like moral lesson at the end. Yeah. I mean, one of the things with detective fiction, of course, is that there are only so many ways you can lock a door mm. and put a corpse behind it. And yeah, right. I think that having a variety in the genre is not a bad thing, even if it does lead to some cheap feeling puzzles like this. But as you say, the puzzle is not the core of the story in the same way yeah. it is in others. Mm -hmm. That said, one of the things that I love most about the puzzles in murder mysteries is going back over them and seeing like, this is where this was foreshadowed. This is where this was foreshadowed. Your second read is like a completely different experience. Mm -hmm. And despite how like tacky the puzzle was in this novel, I think this has been one of the best rereads of a murder mystery I've had. Yeah because you get to go back and see all of the other stuff that's going on in a new light. And because it's still a mystery, you still have that uncovering experience that you would with a conventional whodunity golden age type story. For me, as the veteran, going back and rereading it, my favorite part was reading Noel's lines, particularly when he's interacting with, with the counts. Mm. When he's talking to anyone, he is like deadpanning it. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah, like, it's fantastic. He's a psychopath. Um, even if everything he set up was, you know, kind of a coincidence and he was kind of rolling with it and kind of overwhelmed by the whole thing. Mm. Watching this battle between the two, the, I'm going to keep calling them the two good boys of the story, Albert and Noel, and seeing how Albert is completely clean. He does everything chivalrously and romantically. And then Noel, who's like, oh, don't worry. I'll definitely get, I'll get Albert out of prison. I'm sure that I'll mm. do that. I think, oh, I should double check this, but I'm, I don't think he ever says, I will catch the culprit. He just says, I will get Albert out, yeah. which is one of those fun things of, we don't really know whether he's, like, he's obviously not, you know, he's not going to, you know, out himself, but like, maybe he did want to get Albert out of that situation. Maybe he really did want to say, oh, well, it was, it's somebody else. It's person X, you know, it wasn't me. It mm. wasn't Albert. Um, but like looking through his dialogue and seeing all the times that he lies to people and see that undercurrent of his his debt to Clergeau and, and Juliet and 
all that stuff. It was, it's fantastic to read over. And yeah, I hope I hope you enjoyed that as well. Yeah, I have about like four annotations for every single page of the book. Mm. And every single one of them that is a, a, a null piece of dialogue has uh, a voids <laughs> thing yes. next to it. Yes. Because every line he says, as you he say, dodges. is dodging an issue. And mm-hmm. it's one of those things, I, I picked up on it on the way, but I didn't realize how egregious it was until mm-hmm. a reread. And I really love going back over and being like, oh, and they didn't yeah. mention that, and this one, and this one. Yep. It was, it was a fantastic experience. It's really great. I think one of the other things that I really loved about Noel earlier in the story is that when we first meet Juliet, I realized on a reread, mm. like there isn't even really a clarity clarification on when that scene is happening no not really no like you know obviously it says eight days until i've resolved this but it never says what that resolution is and there are multiple events in the novel that it could be leading up towards sure it does kind of reveal it a bit later in the book yeah claire joe he has a conversation with claire joe where he says um that you know oh i will pay back your debts i just need you to give me an extra week and i'll have all the money i could ever want and he doesn't because he dies, but you know. <laughs> yeah, but I, I really enjoyed going back over and seeing like, oh, okay, so this, you know, this was positioned here in the story. And then all of the reasoning I'd done about what if this was a time jump to after the crime or before the crime or here, mm. there, or there, elsewhere. It really wrapped it up nicely on a reread. And yeah. I think that's perhaps the prime example of a scene that I enjoyed on a reread. Sure, yeah. I think the other thing that, Caught me off guard a little, but I'll still kind of take credit for it. No credit. Mm-hmm. Was, <laughs> I know what you're about to say. No credit. Was Juliet shooting Noel at the end? You know, that is not a double obviously suicide. Obviously, Romeo and Juliet no. parallels right there. Not a double suicide. That is Such a man a being good like. moment, though. He's like, I'm going to kill myself so that I can preserve my honor. And she says, no, you're not. And then she just shoots him in a worse way. So he dies really slowly. <laughs> it's awful. It's. It's oh, just terrible, but it also it. absolutely fits their relationship. It does, yeah. It's a, it's a she beautiful- She ruins him. She ruins <laughs> him financially and then in the physical body. Oh, it's, it's great. It's an excellent little snapshot of their, mm. of their dynamic. Um, and yeah, as you say, these, this is the stuff that I like in this novel. Ah. But here we are, Herds, to rate the fairness of this story. <gasps> and I have to say- Oh, no. I have never witnessed a greater essay <laughs> upon rule six of the Knox Decalogue. Oh, my goodness. Which rule is rule six? No accident must ever help the detective. <laughs> yeah. Nor must he ever have an unaccountable intuition, yeah, that's just which th- proves to be right. That's just this this novel in a nutshell. It's just rule six. <laughs> I am, I am like, convinced that Knox wrote that rule after reading this novel. I, I genuinely <laughs> would not be surprised. It, it's great. The thing is, is, like, If you were to read this rule as no accident must ever help the detective, right? Cool. That's a good rule. Mm -hmm. But then when you add on the nor must he ever have an unaccountable intuition, that's a little more suspicious. That's Mm. a little more this novel. Yeah, sure. Then which proves to be right, that's this novel. Yeah. Hands down. I mean, it's nothing but coincidences and him saying, what if this is a plot thing? And then it just is a plot thing. And that's that's the novel. Mm. Um. (laughs) At the same time, though, it's also an excellent lesson in how to effectively use Rule 8, which is that the detective must not light on any clues which are not instantly produced for the inspection of the reader. There you go. Everything that was noticed was told to us immediately. Yeah, yeah. And I think that, uh, like, it it felt a little clunky, but I feel like that's more because I'm a modern reader and there's a lot of, uh, he thought this, said he, and, like, there's a lot of, older style dialogue which made it feel a bit clunky but I I never thought that when we had a revelation or a piece of evidence that was noticed that it was unjustified I just find that I find that quaint and amusing is the problem the Mm. way that I approach these sorts of novels and movies too Mm. um, I find you know putting in in its perspective of this was written two centuries ago yeah I think oh isn't this quaint isn't it funny how we don't do this anymore mm. because we realized it was clunky and it was kind of dumb yeah um yeah I don't know I, I'm not bothered by that sort of thing personally if if I read a novel that was written you know in the 21st century it was like that I'd be like yo get that out of here unless it's satire mm. but um I I really enjoyed it myself I thought all the characters were great um I don't think there was a bad one in there I think except no Ziphanol. But he was a good boy. He was the, he was good character, but he was a bad character. Oh, if you just, if you catch my cult. Just I do. I shoot. Now, while we're on the topic of Nox rules, I have one last one that I have to bring up, Herds. Go for it. Not more than one secret room or passage is allowable. 
Yeah, there was only one. It was just I, the one in Noel's house. I loved, only... I loved the way they used <laughs> Noel's one because, like, it was like chapter five, and they're just like, "Here it is." Yeah. And then it was the the onus was upon the story to use it again in an entertaining way. Yeah. And the way it used it. Yeah. Ugh. The valet like complains. It's fantastic. I I don't even remember why he uses it. I just remember the conversation with with Tabaret afterwards. Where he, I think he goes to, like see he's trying to get to Juliet. I think or something like that. But yeah. Um, it was it was just so good because earlier in the story when it was first introduced, it was like so that no one would know that he's leaving the building, and then later on the valley is just like ah no, he's using the door again. Yeah. yeah, he complains about it. He's like, oh, why is no using the secret passage? I thought that he would rather come through the front door. I suppose he's trying to save me some trouble with my poor king back. <laughs> it's so good. It's excellent. So ultimately, I guess. I have to, do I call this book fair or not, Herds? I don't know, like- Do you call this book fair? I suppose so. It like it gives us all the clues. Um, it's just that all those clues are coincidence. I don't know, I mean- I think the main thing to me about whether I'm deciding whether or not this story is fair is that I need to know what the blurb on the back of the book said <laughs> in the publication of this. Because I've been reading an ebook, which okay. didn't have it because it was a well, public domain copy, Yeah. right? So I don't know what people came into this story knowing. I knew next to nothing. I think if the story was a bit open in that blurb about what it was, I'd be a lot more receptive to its style of play. Well, would have had a blurb? It was serialized. Like, it was a little thing in the newspaper. Well, yeah, but, you know, in the newspaper, you'd have, like, yes. the, the LaRouge case by Emile Gaboriau. Witness the detective Gab Tabaret goofing around <laughs> whatever. It's true. It's you what know? he does. So... Obviously, that's not like that doesn't change what the book is, mm. but I think that I came in with too different of an expectation to this story than it wanted me to come in. Yeah, I think that I mean, that's the that's the kind of trick with any like any novel in general, really, but especially with, with like mystery novels. If you, you know, you come in expecting there to be, you know, a very light mystery and it turns out to be incredibly complicated, you're like, well, this isn't the novel I signed up for. Um, if someone tells you, you know, this is a story about love or whatever. You might be more primed to figure out the mystery. And that's kind of one of the challenges, especially on, on, on my end, when I'm the veteran of like trying to lead you through the story without just saying, like I was, you know, teasing a little bit in, in the second part, mainly, I think talk about how like, Oh, I, romance really is the true power here. But like, I wasn't really setting expectations for you. I was just teasing. Cause yeah. that's what I do. I mean, um, and that's fine. That's what we're here to do. It's true. It's true. But you know what we're here to do now hurts. Tell us. We're Flex. here to pick a new book. <gasps> now you get to do that this time. I do. What I will have you be got? the veteran this time. I'm doing something a little weird this week. What? This wasn't weird? Mm, this is weirder. Okay, throw it at me. I have three books for you. Well, three stories for you. Three stories? How That's are we supposed right. to do three stories in three weeks? Well, there's this little thing in the world of the mystery game that was very common mm -hmm, around mm -hmm. the Golden Tell Age me. era, which is the... A compendium story. Mm. So next week we will be covering House in the Mist by Anna Catherine Green. The edition of the publication we have contains House in the Mist, The Ruby in the Cauldron, and The Hermit of Blank Street. Blank Street? Does that mean that it doesn't have a name? Or is that the name? That's the name of the street? That's for you to discover. That's crazy. Next week we'll just be covering chapter one of The House in the Mist. But we'll roll on through those other stories in the following week, so make sure you keep an eye on our socials at Flex and Herds to know which stories we're covering as well as listening to the show. Well, I'm looking forward to try and solve not one, not, not two, but three stories? Indeed. My goodness, my work is cut out for me. <laughs> See if I can beat you this time. You rap scallion! Thank you for joining us this time around on the extended cut of Death of the Reader. This has been the LaRouge case. It's been a fun ride, Herds. Yeah, I've enjoyed myself. It's been a good three-week journey, but uh, sadly, all things must come to an end, even even French things. <laughs> uh, <laughs> some might say the French Revolution is going on even today. I wouldn't, but some people might. I don't, I don't think I've heard people say that. I don't think anyone that. has ever said that, but some people probably do say that. But yeah, we'll be, we'll be moving on to uh, The House in the Mist by Anna Catherine Green, say next week, so yes, look forward three to that. Part com the three-part story collection should be a good yeah. bit of fun. Yeah, yeah. Ruby in the Cauldron, and also the, the Hermit of Blank Street, which is a particularly strange one. <laughs> you can catch the extended cut as soon as the uh, original three episodes of that are out. Mm. This is us done for the LaRouge case. See you in the next one. See you then. <laughs>